Suzuki Aruma was an ordinary boy who had a job as a tuna fish boat employee. This was thanks to his disgusting loser parents that had Aruma do their nasty work as they go off and have their own little fun. And if you thought parents couldn't get any worse like yours, they sold their one and only overworking son to a SS rank demon for their own greed. The demon, Sullivan, tells Arumas that his soul has been bought, courtesy of his disgusting loving parents. Sullivan, feeling a bit lonely without a grandchild, practically begs Aruma to be his grandkid. Aruma, poor soul, doesn't know how to say no. Honestly, who could resist the puppy dog eyes of a demon? And here I thought my dad leaving me to go get the milk was bad but I guess I could have been sold off to a demon instead. Regret starts creeping in, but fear not, for Sullivan. The magical decorator turns Aruma's room into a oddly nice worthy devil den. New clothes, fresh smell, demon makeover complete. Well, I may or may not have forgotten that if Aruma happened to say no, he was gonna be eaten, but that's besides the point. Morning comes, and Sullivan, in full dad mode, snaps some pics of Aruma's first day at devil school. Off to Babel's demon school, where hundreds of demon kids fly overhead. Aruma's thinking, phew, they still don't know I'm human. Spoiler alert, the school president already smells something fishy. A muscle-bound demon kid practices with a massive axe, aiming to impress at the entrance ceremony. The demon anthem starts playing, and surprise, Sullivan is the school director. Our boy Aruma gets introduced, and everyone loses their minds. But here's the twist, Sullivan's got one more trick up his sleeve, a spell, a letter, and bam. Aruma's chanting like a pro, the teacher's sweating bullets, but it turns out Aruma's the daredevil of demon spells. Applause and a tough day challenge follow. Dodgeball? Nah, dodging fireballs is Aruma's game, thanks to his overwhelming crises evasion capability. Enter Asmodeus Kun, the representative of new students. He punishes Aruma for stealing the spotlight with a fiery showdown. Dodging fireballs like a boss, Aruma's past life experience comes in handy. The crowd loves it, and even Asmodeus bows down, literally. Now, he's Aruma's loyal minion, all thanks to the Demon Law playbook. And that, my friends, is just the beginning of Suzuki Aruma's devilishly good adventures. Our hero begins his day with a nightmare, dreaming of the good old days when his parents gleefully sold him to a demon. Classic family bonding, right. But fret not, dear listeners, for a lavish breakfast awaits our protagonist, courtesy of the ever-hospitable Sullivan. Now, enter the comedic relief, Opera and his hell gray tea. One sip, and poor Aruma is doing the breakfast boogie, showcasing his extraordinary talent for dramatic reactions. But wait, there's more. Open your mouth, discuss a little, and voila. Opera pulls a Mary Poppins, showering Aruma with gifts, including an embroidered handkerchief and a Hellraiser clock because nothing says welcome to school like demon-themed timepieces. The real challenge, though, lies in Aruma's journey to school. Sullivan, being the over-enthusiastic grandparent, wants to capture every moment, but Opera, ever the sensible sidekick, drags him back home. On the way, we get introduced to the class president, a demon diva, who scolds some boys for not using their demonic tones properly. Aruma, playing it cool, avoids the student council and Asmodeus for a while. However, as is a patient demon and waits for a whopping six hours and six minutes, Asmodeus informs Aruma about the upcoming ritual to summon familiars, and our two protagonists end up in the same group. Asmodeus spills the magical beans, today's magical creature summoning will determine their academic ranks at Babel's. The catch? Aruma wonders if familiars have a taste for humans. Fast forward to the ritual, guided by the irritable advisor, Nabrius Caligo. Step 1, 2, 3, draw, enter, hold, and voila, familiars appear in a puff of smoke. Nabrius warns about disobedient familiars, but as, ever the troublemaker, suggests Aruma can charge at Caligo. Our hero declines, because, well, who wants a detention in demon school? Many students pass the ritual, with Asmodeus scoring a gorgon snake. Nabrius, though, is not impressed, considering the history with Sullivan. When it's Aruma's turn, revenge is on the menu for Caligo. Surprise! Aruma accidentally summons Caligo as his familiar, much to everyone's shock. Caligo is furious and demands Aruma to nullify the contract. Aruma tries his best, pulling and pushing, but the ritual concludes with Caligo transformed into a tiny bat. As applauds Aruma for accidentally summoning another demon, leaving everyone in awe. Now, off to Sullivan to nullify the contract. But plot twist, they're bound for a year and attempting to break it forcefully equals death. Caligo, now bedridden with grief, and Aruma head back to face the consequences. With Aruma's fame skyrocketing, a demon girl in glasses isn't too thrilled. Aruma's becoming the talk of the demon town, as the loyal psychic guides Aruma to the next adventure, getting textbooks. And just when things seem somewhat normal, enter Clara, the ball of energy with a song in her heart and a familiar named Falfel. Chaos ensues as she crashes into the room, singing and stacking boxes like a demon tornado. 
And so, the chaotic, humorous, and devilishly entertaining journey of Suzuki Uruma at Babel's Demon School continues. And now, in the whimsical world of Babel's Demon School, our quirky trio, Uruma, as, which was formerly named Asmodeus, and the mischievous green-haired demon girl, Valak Clara, embarks on another adventure of chaos and camaraderie. Enter Clara, a ball of energy with a song in her heart, happily skipping and singing her way into the scene. But as ever the knowledgeable guide warns Aruma that getting attached to Clara is a pain in the demonic posterior, a teacher appears, stopping Clara from stacking boxes and, in a bizarre twist, ties the three misfits together with a rope, leaving them floating in mid-air, textbooks in tow. As Clara playfully suggests a game, as urges Aruma to flee, but the poor guy can't say no. The result? Aruma reluctantly playing along, and as getting the role of the next door neighbor wife in this impromptu demon playdate. Things take a hilarious turn when Clara, armed with a big axe, tries to take a swing at ass. Demon playtime at its finest. Soon, Clara has them engaged in a two-hour play session, complete with snacks and drinks magically stored in her secret pockets. However, trouble arrives in the form of three demon boys who only use Clara for snacks and drinks, never bothering to play with her. Classic demon boys, am I right? The story unfolds over the next few days, with Irma and As becoming regular players in Clara's whimsical world. On the third day, though, Clara overhears some boys gossiping about Aruma using her. Heartbroken, she offers all her goodies to Aruma, who, in a heartwarming twist, declines and assures her he'll play with her without all the treats. But Clara's tears don't last long. Aruma's genuine offer to play brings immense joy, as it's the first time someone has invited her without any conditions. The trio's newfound bond faces a test when the three demon boys return demanding drinks. Clara, in a sudden burst of confidence, retaliates, hitting one of the boys with a vending machine and making them pay for their drinks, as steps in to handle the bullies, demonstrating his protective side for Clara. The next day, the trio shows up at Sullivan's home to pick up Aruma, and Sullivan couldn't be happier that Aruma is making friends, as suggests heading to the cafeteria, where the trio discovers the intricate rank-based ordering system, and the school lunch perks. As, ever resourceful, advises Aruma to get anything he wants, and even goes on a food-fetching mission for him. However, the trio's peaceful meal is disrupted when a group of demon boys orders excessive food, prompting As to contemplate a lesson in manners. But, surprise, Aruma finishes all the food before As can make his move, leaving everyone astonished, including the unconscious chef. Cum Cum arrives to deliver the unfortunate news that Clara is banned from the store, and the store guy threatens her with a bamboo stick. Enter Caligo, the grumpy advisor, who adds another layer of chaos to the mix. Caligo, unfortunately, is not on good terms with Aruma. Clara, ever curious, discovers that Caligo is Aruma's familiar. With a swift summoning, Caligo turns into a small brat. However, trouble brews as they are accused of shoplifting, leading to a chaotic escape. As they enjoy ice cream on the ground, the trio expresses their wish to be classmates. Aruma, being the friendly soul he is, introduces the concept of friends to Clara and As, opening a new chapter in their peculiar bond. In a meeting room, Sullivan, the master puppeteer, finalizes class assignments, placing Aruma, Valak Clara, and Asmodeus in the misfit class for problem children. And so, the misadventures of Suzuki Aruma and his demon companions continue. The twisted tales of Babel's demon school continue as Suzuki Aruma finds himself in a special class, surrounded by misfit companions. Sullivan, the puppet master, reveals that he intentionally placed Aruma in this class to keep him unnoticed. It seems our dear protagonist's wish to remain low-key is about to be granted. As they make their way to the first year tower, As throws in a bit of demon trivia, mentioning that demons typically fly. However, he commends Aruma for strengthening his legs through walking. The news of being in different classes saddens Aiko, but little does she know that she, too, is part of the misfit crew. Upon entering the tower, they follow an arrow leading them to a room labeled one, danger. Inside, a mischievous demon boy steals accessories from his unsuspecting classmates. The arrow then guides them into a cave, where Uruma's extraordinary defensive skills come into play. Dodging a barrage of arrows with his overwhelming crises evasion capability, Uruma becomes the unexpected star of the show. The classmates reveal they had placed bets on his defense ability. However, there's one demon who got hit, Sabnok Sabnok, a massive demon with aspirations of becoming the Yod, the highest ranked demon, and eventually, the Demon King. Sabnok, known for his disdain for anyone in his way, fought his teacher and ended up in the misfit class. A heated exchange between Sabnok and Aruma ensues, with As stepping in to protect his friend. Sabnok challenges As, claiming he has a more powerful familiar, but As surprises everyone by declaring himself as Aruma's friend. The concept of friendship is introduced to the demons, leaving them thrilled. Caligo, the grumpy teacher, enters the scene, skillfully dodging arrows, and announces himself as the class teacher due to the school store mishap. 
Their first lesson begins with a race to the end of the valley, and ranks will be determined based on the race and familiar class results. The cute guide introduces two routes, the easy warbling one and the hard cutthroat valley. However, Caligo warns against the cutthroat valley due to moody guards. Sabnok, ever defiant, insists on taking the hard route. As the race starts, most demon kids fly, but Uruma, lacking wings, stands still. Caligo pushes him like a father trying to get rid of his son and Uruma falls down the mountain edge. Caligo monitors the race from the endpoint, disappointed with the student's antics, as racing with true spirit is accompanied by Clara. Sabnok leaves them behind and braves the cutthroat valley, facing curses and a giant beast. As Caligo contemplates Uruma, a demon crow is seen flying with Uruma in its beak. Meanwhile, Clara faces a demon flower and as wonders about Uruma's fate. To everyone's surprise, Uruma lands in a colossal bird's net. The injured bird, touched by Uruma's kindness, allows him to heal it with his blood and offers him a ride. While Sabnok faces the giant cutthroat valley guard, the narrative takes an intriguing turn. The misfit class's adventures continue, with unexpected friendships, challenges, and, of course, a touch of devilish humor. As Uruma rides on the injured bird, they find themselves on a strange path adorned with numerous stop signs. Meanwhile, Sabnok, in the cutthroat valley, bites his necklace to form a weapon and engages in a fierce battle with the guard. Imagining his family, Sabnok summons a sword with a second bite and continues the fight. However, the guard proves formidable and throws Sabnok away. Just as the demon guard is about to strike a fatal blow, Aruma mysteriously appears and stands in the way. Surprisingly, the guard stops attacking, and an injured bird communicates with Aruma. While Sabnok plans to attack, Aruma intervenes, leading to the guard bowing in front of them. Back at the goal, Az and Clara are the first and second to reach. Despite other students reaching the goal, Az stops Caligo from ending the lesson. Suddenly, a guard from the Cutthroat Valley appears. Caligo moves to protect the students, but the entire class is left astonished as Uruma and Sabnok ride over the guard. Their unconventional approach earns them punishment for defying the rules. In the ranking ceremony, students receive badges from a rank owl, and Caligo instructs others to humiliate Aruma and Sabnok by throwing stones at them. Sabnok, recognizing Aruma's strength, declares him a rival for the Demon King's throne. As the rankings unfold, Clara surprisingly secures a higher rank than Az, and Sabnok gets the second rank. However, when Aruma goes to receive his rank, the owl flies away, leaving Aruma with a golden ring of Solomon on his right hand. The ring emits a black flame that grows and shrieks uncontrollably. The black flame, named the gluttonous feeder ring, poses a threat, biting anyone who approaches and draining their power. When Caligo attempts to intervene, the black smoke threatens him. Just as Caligo is about to take drastic measures, Sullivan appears, controlling the black flame and trapping it inside the ring. Sullivan reveals that the ring will store Aruma's powers and attempt to devour others' powers when empty. The key to control is substantial feeding. A group photo marks the end of the first lesson, but Aruma, now unable to be ranked, is content with being the lowest one. Little does he know that he's become even more notorious. As the students read an article on Aruma, a displeased girl with glasses reflects the discontent. In the school assembly hall, they come together to sing the school song. In the student council room, the student representative discovers the school newspaper filled with stories about Aruma. Meanwhile, Sullivan, ever the theatrical devil, orchestrates a grand carriage ride for Aruma's journey to school, accompanied by opera. Inside the carriage, Aruma ponders the mysteries of the black flame within the gluttonous feeder ring and its eventual hunger for Sullivan's power. As they arrive at the school gate, Opera rolls out a red carpet, announcing Uruma's grand entrance. As always the observant demon appraises Uruma's carriage, and chaos ensues when Clara, hidden beneath the carpet, thuds as for his attention. Sullivan hands Uruma his school bag and a hell phone, but Uruma, reluctant to stand out, makes a swift escape. Caligo takes roll call, and the class learns that other teachers will be taking their classes for the day. Clara and Az try to lift Aruma's spirits. In their diabotany class in the class tower, they encounter Stola's Susie, who teaches them the magical art of blooming flowers. Aruma, who lacks magical prowess, is worried about his performance. A group of upperclassmen in the student council, including Sabnok, watches students showcase their magical abilities. Sabnok boasts about the student council's interest in his progress but ends up with a flower eating its own pot, earning him a B+. Az impresses with a beautiful fire flower, earning enough fight ensues between Sabnok and Az, halted by Stolas using demonic plant branches. As other students bloom stunning flowers, Clara unleashes the weirdest one. When it's Uruma's turn, he imagines a beautiful flower from the human world and utters the word Quan Quan. A dazzling light envelops the class tower, and a majestic cherry blossom tree begins to bloom. In awe, everyone, including Sullivan and Opera, witnesses the extraordinary sight. 
The class president is informed, and she recognizes that these flowers only bloom in the human world. Intrigued, she decides to talk to Aruma. Demon School Babbles, with six classes and 666 demon students, has a group known as the Student Council responsible for maintaining peace. The president of the Student Council, while walking through the hallways, is informed that Aruma wasn't in class. She believes in the existence of humans but thinks they stopped contact with demons. Working on a theory, she suspects Aruma might be human. In a secret room filled with human world manga, the president reads a story about a girl in love with a boy. She fears being enchanted by the human world books. Meanwhile, Aruma cleans up the mess from the cherry blossom tree. Stola's offers to help, but Aruma declines. The president takes a manga with her and runs to her room. Later, as Aruma helps the old workers, as burns the waste with his magic. Clara, mischievous as ever, drops a ton of waste on them. After sending As home, Uruma returns to put back the cleaning supplies. In another part of the hallway, the president is approaching, and a collision with Uruma sets off a peculiar encounter. As the president learns Uruma's name, she becomes infuriated, convinced that he is human and attempting to charm her into falling in love with him. The mysteries surrounding Uruma's origins deepen, weaving a captivating tale in the supernatural realm of Babel's demon school. The president gets super mad when she finds out she bumped into Uruma. She thinks he's trying to make her fall for him. Uruma is scared because he upset her, so he apologizes and tries to get away. The president plans to hand Uruma over to her father, who's the head of security. Suddenly, Uruma tries to escape, and a manga from the human world falls on the ground. Uruma grabs the manga before the president and starts reading it. Turns out, he loves the series, and it reminds him of when he was an assistant in writing it. The president gets excited that Uruma can read the series and quizzes him on different letters. She takes him to a room and asks him to read the manga aloud. Aruma hesitates because he figures out that demons can't read human language, but the president insists. Since Aruma can't say no to requests, he starts reading. After finishing, he realizes it's dark outside, and his grandpa has been calling him. The president adds her number to Aruma's phone and tells him to come whenever she calls. Before leaving, Aruma asks her name, and she says it's Amory. Aruma leaves thinking it was kind of fun. Later, Amory decides to take precautions as she confirms Aruma is human. When he's in his room, as informs him that the student council and the president want to talk about the cherry blossom tree. In the morning, Opera asks if Uruma wants to go back to the human world. Uruma remembers his tough life there and his joys in the devil world. Opera suggests graduating with good results if he wants to return. She informs him that his grandpa has gone to get the carriage. Uruma runs to his friends, and at school, he ponders why he hasn't considered going back to the human world. Amri texts him to come to the common room. During lunch, As and Clara offer Aruma their lunches, but he leaves upon getting Amri's text. Sabnak arrives, and As and Clara follow Aruma to find out what's going on. In the meeting room, Amri dismisses the student council meeting, saying she's going on a date, which means extra special school rounds. She warns them not to follow. Meanwhile, Clara searches for Aruma all over the school. As asks her to be discreet. As and Clara get detection warding glasses, making them vague and unnoticed. Outside the common room, Aruma waits for Amri, who comes running. As and Clara see them together and think Uruma is trying to take over the school. In the common room, when Uruma reads the manga, he asks Amri about her ambitions. She wants to make the demon school the best and help her father after graduation. Uruma just wants to have fun with everyone. Amri tells him it's an ideal, not an ambition, and asks about his dream. As and Clara watch all this from the window. Amri, intrigued by Uruma's dreams, questions him about his aspirations while As and Clara discreetly observe the conversation from the window. Clara, eager to join the discussion, is held back by As's restraint. Despite As's curiosity, he manages to resist the urge to eavesdrop. However, Uruma, unable to provide a clear answer, collapses, and a scuffle ensues as As prevents Clara from hitting the door. Amidst the chaos, Amri offers Uruma advice, suggesting that he become a bet and dare to dream. Suddenly, As and Clara burst into the room through the smoke, catching them off guard. Amri, attempting to hide a human manga, finds herself in an awkward situation. Clara, determined to have Uruma with her, whisks him away, while Amri, with a mysterious smile, asks him to be on her side. That night, Clara dreams of Amri stealing Uruma away, fueling her determination. Meanwhile, Uruma contemplates his desire to achieve a higher rank, as, wrestling with temptations about Uruma's plans, struggles to find rest. The next day, seeking guidance on winning Uruma back, Clara consults with Sabnok, who suggests a demon lesson on the art of charming someone. During class selection, Uruma opts for a lecture classroom to avoid standing out, and surprisingly, as chooses the same elective. 
However, Clara decides on a class labeled Seductive Girls, taught by the attractive Rame Sensei, as, pitying Clara and assuming a misunderstanding, is left puzzled when she joins the class without offering any explanation. In the Seductive class, Rame instructs the students to read in a way that makes others fall for them. Clara, scoring low in Rame's assessment, is advised to read extra books to appear more innocent than a baby. Undeterred, Clara attempts various tactics, including posing, touching, wearing peculiar outfits, adding excessive perfume, and using makeup, failing at each step. Disheartened, she returns home but finds solace in the support of her siblings. Clara decides on her final, bold step, kissing. The next morning, she combines all her learned steps but accidentally collides with Caligo. Concerned for Clara, Raym offers pheromone perfume. But Clara defiantly refuses, determined to find her own way to win Aruma's heart. Clara, feeling lonely and doubting her attractiveness, sat alone in the garden. Maruma, noticing her solitude, approached and gently told her that she shouldn't be sitting alone in a place like that, especially since she's a girl. Clara, excited by Aruma's concern, enthusiastically declared that she would make him fall in love with her. In that moment, something stirred within Aruma, a feeling he couldn't quite put into words. Taking the initiative, Clara grabbed Aruma's hand and spiritedly led him on a quest to find S. Through the window, Raim observed that Clara's scope score had inexplicably increased to 10%, leaving her puzzled about what had transpired. As night fell, Aruma praised Clara for her lively spirit, and in that moment, he recalled Amory's words. It was then that he made a silent determination regarding his goals. The next morning, as was astonished when Aruma expressed his desire to achieve a higher rank, Aruma, our demon in training, had an epiphany. Amory, with all her wisdom, advised him to level up in the demonic hierarchy. Excitedly, Aruma announced to Az in the cafeteria that he's aiming to climb from Aleph to Bet rank. As, always the drama enthusiast, misinterprets this as Aruma planning to take over the entire demon kingdom. He declares it to the entire school, turning Aruma into an unintentional legend. But hold your demon horses. Aruma clarifies that he simply wants to reach Bet rank, not conquer the underworld. The students, momentarily disappointed, are still intrigued by what our unsuspecting hero has in store. Meanwhile, a demon girl with glasses is eyeing Aruma with envy, as, being the proactive friend, drags Aruma away for training. Just when they thought they were in the clear, the bamboo guy, Clara stuck to his bamboo, demands to join their adventure. Because, you know, every good training session needs a bamboo-wielding sidekick. As takes Aruma to the demon gym, revealing the periodic rank promotion exam. Instead of fighting monsters and caimans, they now play a demon version of dodgeball in marked territories. As, being as, asks Clara to unleash cursed puppets for practice. Chaos, of course, ensues. While everyone is dodging the ball like pros, Aruma realizes this is basically demonic dodgeball. Aruma, however, feels like he's missing something crucial. As suggests consulting someone with a higher rank. Enter Grandpa. Sullivan takes Aruma to a mysterious ground and unveils a magical spell. Aruma, being the ethical demon, hesitates to use magic. So, Grandpa strengthens his hands instead. After some intense hand strengthening exercises, Opera takes over the training. Aruma, used to dodging, learns the art of hitting the ball. After a rigorous training day, Aruma gets encouraging messages from his friends. But, being a diligent demon student, he goes for a solo training session with Opera. Despite aching hands and diverse Opera moods, Aruma keeps at it. His friends cheer him on, even organizing a manga reading break for him. However, the plot thickens. Despite all the hard work, Aruma struggles to catch the ball. Opera, concerned, updates Sullivan on this surprising development. But fear not, our determined Aruma continues training, and finally, after what feels like demon eternities, he catches the elusive ball. Clara and Az erupt in cheers, and even Opera gives a nod of approval. Aruma, my friends, is ready to conquer the dodgeball underworld. The day of the execution cannonball has arrived, and Opera, the wise demon mentor, advises Aruma to flip his fear into excitement. In the demon world, fearing your enemy is equivalent to admitting defeat before the game even begins. With newfound determination, Aruma heads to demon school alongside his friends, leaving a buzz of speculation among the students about whether he will emerge victorious. Amory, standing pensively near the window, contemplates the significance of the execution exam. Meanwhile, Caligo gathers all the students and leads them to the training gym for the impending showdown. Enter the cute explanation thing, breaking down the game rules in its adorable way. Two teams are formed, each with one player stationed outside the court. The objective is simple, hit opponents inside the court with the ball to eliminate them. However, the twist is that players outside the court can still influence the game. Magic can't be used directly on other students, but it's fair game when it comes to manipulating the ball. 
The rank of the students hit and the winning team determine the individual ranks. Team A gets the stylish yellow, and Team B gets the fiery red. Surprisingly, Clara finds herself on Team A, but the plot thickens when Aruma and Az end up on opposing teams. Faced with this dilemma, Az, being the loyal friend, decides to secretly aid Aruma in his quest for victory. The game kicks off, and Team Red targets Sabnok. However, Sabnok's teammate saves him from the impending hit, turning the tide. Sabnok retaliates, launching the ball towards the girl with glasses, who skillfully fends off the attack. Just when it seems like the ball is about to hit a girl, Kamui intervenes but, alas, crosses the enemy's line, leading to his disqualification. But fear not, for Clara unleashes her chaos. Dozens of balls emerge from her mysterious pockets, bewildering everyone. Sabnok, in a comedic twist, grabs the wrong ball and hurls it into the chaos. Balls are flying left and right, and just as the confusion peaks, Uruma leaps into action, skillfully grabbing the real ball mid-air. The crowd erupts in surprise and cheers as Uruma secures a triumphant moment in the execution cannonball game. The excitement in the execution cannonball game reaches its peak as Augers, unfortunately, falls victim to disqualification due to unauthorized magic use on something other than the ball. Meanwhile, Uruma finds himself in uncharted territory as he hasn't practiced the art of ball throwing. In a surprising turn of events, Sabnok seizes the opportunity, snatches the ball from Uruma, and hurls it towards Az with vengeance. Az, however, displays some unexpected skills, capturing the ball and retaliating with a furious throw. The ball finds its mark, eliminating Sabnok from the court. Az doesn't stop there, he goes on to hit Clara, showcasing his prowess in the game. The chaotic exchange continues until only Az and Uruma remain inside the court. Az, torn between friendship and competition, briefly contemplates letting Uruma win. However, a wave of determination washes over him as he recalls Uruma's intense training. Channeling all his power, Az delivers a precise hit on Uruma. Yet, Uruma, displaying quick reflexes and evasive skills developed through rigorous training, manages to stop the ball. With newfound confidence, he retaliates by launching the ball towards Az with all his might. The decisive hit lands, securing victory for Team A. As the dust settles, Amri, accompanied by the student council members, arrives at the training gym. Expecting to witness Az's performance, the student council is surprised and impressed by Uruma's unexpected triumph. Tima celebrates Uruma's success, and Team B applauds Az for his incredible throw. Kaligo, the ever-analytical teacher, observes Uruma's utilization of evasive abilities to throw the ball with Az's power. Acknowledging the impressive display, Kaligo awards Uruma the coveted bet rank. Congratulations and cheers echo through the gym as Uruma basks in the glory of his achievement. Amory, appearing in her authoritative manner, congratulates Uruma on his well-deserved victory. Feeling a surge of happiness and excitement in his chest, Uruma heads home. He proudly shows his bet rank to Grandpa and Opera, expressing gratitude for their guidance and training. With a heart full of joy, Uruma drifts off to sleep, content with the day's triumphs. In the morning, a new green demon arrives at the demon school. In the common room, Uruma reads the manga for Amory, and when the devil bell rings, Amory heads to class. Uruma contemplates whether he should raise his rank again. In the classroom, a new teacher, Bals Robin, is introduced as the familiar teacher for Uruma's class. Bals explains his enthusiasm for teaching and how it made him late. During the lesson, students are asked to summon their familiars. As and Sabnak proudly showcase their familiars. Bals is surprised by Clara's foulful familiar and her non-verbal communication with it. When Aruma is asked to summon his familiar, he hesitates, but Bals requests it, and Aruma, unable to decline, summons his familiar. Meanwhile, Caligo, in his office, transforms into a bat and scolds Aruma for summoning him. Bals is astonished to see a talking familiar. Caligo attempts to disobey Aruma but gets punished. Other students laugh at the situation. Later, Aruma and Caligo sit together, and Caligo reluctantly agrees to help Aruma. He explains that the familiar's shape depends on the master's ability. Bals guides them through exercises to build trust, causing laughter among students witnessing Caligo's antics. Aruma apologizes to Caligo for the humiliation of summoning. An irritated Caligo questions why Aruma didn't summon him when guards from Cutthroat Valley threatened him. Aruma explains he was concerned for both Caligo and the guards' safety. Meanwhile, as and Sabnok engage in a familiar fight due to a heated argument. Caligo intervenes, thrashing their familiars and emphasizing the importance of trust between familiars and their masters. Familiars, being beasts, can cause massive destruction if out of control. 
He praises Aruma for understanding his familiar's true potential. Students start building trust with their familiars. In the office, Caligo hands over files to Baus. Aruma enjoys lunch with his friends in the empty cafeteria when a group of girls disturbs them briefly. As explains the concept of battlers for raising ranks, akin to clubs. As makes Aruma witness the battler's entry, and to Aruma's terror, he sees a group of giant beasts as the battlers. Outside the school gates, a charismatic battler takes the stage, initially advocating for niceness and courtesy among butlers. However, in a sudden twist, he discards the loudspeaker and urges the battlers to crush anyone in their way. Chaos ensues as a battler approaches Aruma, but as valiantly steps in to save his friend. As more battlers close in on Az, he summons a protective fire circle, keeping them at bay. Az explains that these battlers have a mere 66 minutes each day to aggressively recruit first years for their teams. Their strategies vary, and the competition for potential team members can be intense. As hints at a potential savior from this chaos, the student council. Enter the student council president, and the once rowdy battlers instantly fall in line. However, her attention turns to Aruma, inviting him to join the student council's battler team. The devil bell rings, marking the end of the battler round. Caligo encourages students to choose their battlers wisely, emphasizing the potential for rank improvement. The students scatter, with as fervently burning any flyers he receives. In contrast, Aruma finds himself bombarded with hundreds of flyers, much to Clara's surprise. As remains committed to burning every flyer he gets, highlighting his disinterest in joining any battler group. Other students share their undecided or nonchalant attitudes toward choosing a battler. When one curious student asks Aruma about his choice, he raises his hand, only to be unexpectedly propelled by an unseen force. Tumbling through the hallway, he collides with a bleeding demon. Apologizing profusely, Aruma learns that the demon is weak and crafted a necklace from the same metal as Aruma's ring. The demon explains that the ring is drawn to the necklace, designed to empower weaker demons with magic. Aruma, finding the situation relatable, absorbs this intriguing information. As and Clara join the scene, and the trio embarks on a journey to explore different battlers. Their visit to the Diabotany battler takes an unexpected turn as a flower engulfs Clara, setting the stage for more peculiar adventures. In their quest to find the right battler, Aruma, As, and Clara venture into the library battler, only to witness student demons engaged in a heated fight. Deciding it's not the right fit, they explore other options, including the document battler where Sabnok immerses himself in reading about the Demon King. The trio then explores the Black Magic Battler and the Succubus Battler, a choice Clara is particularly enthusiastic about. As, however, manages to dissuade her, leaving them without a clear choice. Frustrated, they head back to Sullivan's home, where Aruma shares concerns about his ring occasionally acting up. To address this, Sullivan adds a circle with three levels to the ring, and he teaches Aruma a spell, Raphire, which conjures a small magical fire based on different modes, Devil Mode, Devil Mode Plus, and Ifrit. Sullivan cautions Aruma about the potential danger of the Ifrit mode and advises him to be careful. In case of an emergency, Sullivan introduces the powerful spell Pandarula, which releases all the magic at once, urging Aruma to use it cautiously. The next day, the trio explores battler stalls at school, with Clara being indecisive and exploring every option. When Az inquires about Aruma's choice, he reveals an invitation from the Cannonball Execution Battler and expresses a particular plan in mind. In the gym training, Aruma meets the members of the Cannonball Execution Battler and, to showcase his prowess, he uses the spell Labora to throw a ball. Although the members catch it, they find the throw satisfactory and invite Aruma to join their battler. As they move through the hallway, Aruma receives a text from Amory, thanking her for the invitation and expressing surprise at her role as the student council president. Moments later, a commotion in a nearby room catches their attention. Upon entering, they discover the magical apparatus Battler, adding another layer of intrigue to their Battler exploration. Battlers, gatherings of ambitious demons striving to climb the ranks, offer various clubs for like-minded individuals. Aruma, still contemplating which Battler to join, finds himself at the crossroads of choices. Meanwhile, Amory, brimming with excitement for this year's Battlers, channels her energy into decorating the room to impress Aruma and convince him to join her Battler group. As Amory finishes the decorations, she eagerly texts Aruma, inviting him to visit the student council. Aruma, intending to stop by later, sends a reply to inform her. However, his plans take an unexpected turn when a sudden explosion rocks the surroundings. 
balancing himself, Aruma investigates and discovers a fellow demon unconscious. He texts Amri about the incident, apologizing for the change in his plans. The fallen demon turns out to be Amy Kariwo, a member of the Magical Apparatus Battler. After apologizing for the earlier explosion during a Magical Apparatus calibration attempt, Amy introduces himself. Aruma explores the room, and Amy, generous and sharing, explains the purpose of his battler, studying magical apparatus from various sources and constructing them. Amy reveals his unique condition. Every time he activates his magic to operate the apparatus, he experiences dizziness and bleeding. Acknowledging his frailty and limited magic, Amy confides in Aruma, who, having spent his childhood fixing broken things, is unfazed. Amy showcases a magical enhancement apparatus prototype, which caused the earlier explosion. In a heartwarming moment, Aruma, adept at piecing things together, reconstructs the shattered apparatus battery into a heart shape. Amy tests the enhanced apparatus successfully, expressing his goal to invent a device that bridges the power gap between strong and weak demons. Aruma, intrigued by the idea, supports Amy but realizes the potential backlash from high-ranked demons. Curious about Aruma's whereabouts, Asmodeus and Clara go in search of him. Spotting Aruma walking towards them, he shares the story of his encounter with Amy, shedding light on the unique and innovative world of the magical apparatus Battler. On the final day of Battler trials, Amy finds himself in another mishap, causing a massive explosion in his lab. Aruma, accompanied by Asmodeus and Clara, arrives on the scene. To Amy's shock, three new recruits express their interest in joining his battler. Meanwhile, Amory, feeling dejected as Aruma joined another battler, sits alone in the student council room. Unexpectedly, Aruma enters, admiring the room's decorations, lifting Amory's spirits. Amory serves tea, but her mood sours when she learns about Aruma joining a different battler, thinking he had committed to the student council. It takes Aruma two hours to clarify the situation, easing Amory's frustrations. The battler, undeterred by Amy's explosive mishap, organizes a presentation party to introduce new members, where parents of first-year freshmen are also invited. Aruma draws parallels between the party and parents' day at school, emphasizing the familial atmosphere. Principal Sullivan, absent from the battler presentation due to attending the 13th dinner with Netherlands' greatest heroes, engages in discussions about the challenges faced by the netherworld in the absence of a demon king. The meeting on the 666th floor sees Lady Levy and Belial advocating for Sullivan to choose the new demon king, expressing their trust in him. The trio argues over the decision while showcasing their grandchild. Henry, Lady Levy's father, enters the room and thanks Sullivan for looking after his daughter Amory. However, he presents Sullivan with an arrest warrant, accusing him of illegally crossing into the human world, and asks him to accompany him to the station. As Sullivan faces legal troubles, Opera dutifully serves dinner to Aruma, highlighting the stark contrast between the celebration of the battler presentation and the unfolding events in the higher echelons of the netherworld. Sullivan's abrupt call to Opera sends ripples through the household bearing unexpected news of his arrest and the impossibility of returning home anytime soon. With a heavy heart, Sullivan instructs Opera to take care of Aruma in his absence. Opera, somberly relaying the message to Aruma, explains that Sullivan has urgent matters to attend to. As the demon version of Parents' Day looms closer at Babel's school, nervous anticipation spreads among the first-year students. However, Aruma, having never experienced a human school or parental involvement, doesn't quite share the same anxieties. The concept of parents showing up is alien to him, but a sudden realization about Sullivan triggers a wave of nervousness akin to his peers. Meanwhile, Clara, bubbling with excitement, eagerly anticipates her entire family's attendance on Parents' Day. The atmosphere at the school is charged with a mix of nerves and excitement. A demon teacher approaches Caligo, summoning him to Sullivan's office. There, he receives the unsettling news of Sullivan's arrest by demon border control. Tasked with taking over Sullivan's responsibilities, Caligo grumbles about the added workload but senses something fishy. He warns his fellow teachers to be on guard during the upcoming Battler's presentation day. Amidst the preparations, Aruma queries Asmodeus and Amy about their parents' attendance. Asmodeus, desperately attempting to prevent his mother's arrival, contrasts with Amy, who reveals being ostracized by his family due to his low magic abilities. Aruma, understanding Amy's plight, shares a bond of having less than ideal parental figures. Amy can confides in Aruma that his senior, acting as a guardian, will attend his presentation. The group gears up for the presentation, armed with their magical apparatus. Arriving at the presentation ground, Aruma is taken aback by the extravagant decorations. Amy discloses the high stakes, the best presentation earns a substantial prize, and groups may even ascend in rank. However, a stark contrast emerges when they approach their presentation stall, a cramped space barely a fraction of what others enjoy. Amy's third-year status, coupled with his lower rank, means limited budget and space, 
showcasing the hierarchical dynamics within the demonic school. Facing the challenge of creating a stellar presentation, Amy turns to his group members for ideas. Aruma, after careful consideration of each member's specialty, proposes the unique concept of fireworks. The idea resonates with Amy, Asmodeus, and Clara, but there's a hitch. The other members haven't heard of fireworks before. Aruma takes on the role of explaining this captivating display of light and sound to his intrigued companions. As the group enthusiastically embraces the idea, Amy realizes that creating fireworks requires experimenting with gunpowder. Determined to perfect their presentation, the group decides to pull an all-nighter for the experiments. In the midst of their experiments, an unexpected and massive explosion rocks the room. Miraculously, Amy remains unharmed, thanks to his bloodline barrier technique that suppresses the explosion. The challenge of creating something entirely unfamiliar proves daunting for Amy. In a stroke of genius, Aruma reaches out to Amory for help. He requests a specific comic book on first love, which features a scene depicting fireworks. Initially reluctant to lend her precious comic, Amory changes her mind upon learning about the group's mission to create fireworks. Armed with the visual aid from the comic book, the group successfully completes their first experiment, bringing joy and satisfaction to all involved. As night falls, exhaustion looms, but Clara sparks a playful challenge, a duo pillow fight. Clara teams up with Asmodeus, while Uruma partners with Amy. The lively pillow fight ensues, with Uruma showcasing his impressive dodging skills, leaving everyone breathless and exhilarated. However, the night takes an unexpected turn when Amy receives a call from his brother. The ominous conversation reveals a dark plot. Amy's brother instructs him to stick to the plan of destroying Babel's school, exploiting the absence of Sullivan who is away due to the tip Amy's brother gave to border control. The revelation casts a shadow over the group's joyful endeavors, hinting at potential challenges and conflicts ahead. Aruma and his party find themselves at the cafeteria, eagerly watching a show introducing the upcoming battler's party. The festival is primarily for the three lower classes, as the upperclassmen will be engrossed in their workshops. The party is set to take place in the front garden and the central plaza, promising a vibrant and competitive atmosphere. The show highlights enticing prizes for the best battlers. The victor receives a luxurious battler room, an increased budget, and a prize of their choice. However, the grand prize is the most coveted, a rank increase by two. Each battler is fervently preparing for their presentations, and Uruma, Clara, and Asmodeus are no exception. Meanwhile, Amy informs Asmodeus that he has some personal matters to attend to. Amy heads towards the corridor and activates a secret switch, revealing a concealed room. In this hidden chamber, Amy's brother is plotting a nefarious plan involving a massive explosion and numerous casualties during the party. The key elements required for this sinister plan are Amy's abilities and the enhancement machine he has crafted. Amy acknowledges that without Uruma's assistance, executing such a plan would have been impossible. As Amy readies his machine, Uruma unexpectedly enters the secret room, guided by his magical ring. Amy, shocked by Uruma's presence, discloses the room's name, Magi App's Graveyard. He explains that it once belonged to battlers who worked on peculiar projects that could get them in trouble if discovered. The special soundproof glass ensures that no outsiders can see or hear them. Observing the central plaza, they spot Caligo, Robin Sensei, and other students. Amy starts calling Caligo names, surprising Aruma. Clarifying through the special glass, Amy reveals they are invisible and inaudible to outsiders. He shares that he entered the room to mentally prepare himself. In a surprising move, Aruma holds Amy's hand and proposes they aim for the grand prize at the battler party. This shocks Amy, who believes such a prize is usually won by top-class battlers with power demons. A childhood traumatic memory briefly overtakes Amy, but Aruma brings him back to reality. Deciding to refocus on preparations, Amy urges Aruma to keep the hidden base a secret. The battler party commences, and Asmodeus, preparing for the event, learns about the unexpected arrival of his mother. Desperate to avoid her, he implores his butler, David, to intervene. Meanwhile, Aruma waits for Sullivan, with Opera reassuring him that despite Sullivan's carefree nature, he always fulfills his promises. The eve of the battler party unfolds, and it's the grandest event at Babel's school. Students are hustling to sell food items, and every battler is eyeing the coveted grand prize. Asmodeus suggests that Aruma and Amy scout other battlers as they navigate the lively venue. Amy agrees but opts to conserve his energy for the upcoming events. While strolling, they come across a battler who has prepared a mega food challenge. Aruma, intrigued, asks if he can take on the challenge. The owner laughs at the idea, but his amusement turns to shock as Aruma effortlessly conquers the Yakisoba challenge. Later, Sabnok's boisterous laughter catches their attention. Aruma, Clara, and Asmodeus stop to inquire about Sabnok's plans for the party day. Sabnok reveals a theatrical performance involving the Demon King, with his battler presenting an anecdote about the former Demon King. 
Jazz, another classmate, joins the conversation, sharing his involvement in a new magic battler focused on creating innovative magic. Asmodeus briefs Aruma and Clara on their plan, titled Strike Fast for Certain Victory. The plan involves launching fireworks at the countdown to party day to captivate everyone's attention. After the party eve, all students gather in the central plaza, awaiting the bell that signals the beginning of the party day. Aruma is entrusted with the task of launching the fireworks. However, things take an unexpected turn when Clara inadvertently lights the fireworks rope. Despite Aruma's attempts to extinguish the fire, the fireworks fail to launch, leaving them unaware of the missing shell. Unbeknownst to them, Amy has the shell in the hidden base. Ball, Amy's senpai, is revealed to be the one who tipped off border control about Sullivan's alleged illegal activities in the human world. Aruma and his party are absent from their stall, causing Amory to anxiously wait for Aruma to initiate the fireworks. As Aruma, Asmodeus, and Clara search for Amy, they realize he is nowhere to be found. Asmodeus checks obvious places like the cafeteria and inner courtyard but to no avail. The only option left is to wait. Meanwhile, Amy is preparing for the crucial moment. The school is alive with battlers enjoying their stalls, but chaos ensues when Amy recalls Ball's instruction to commence the show. Breaking a purple stone on his collar, the entire school ground shakes. Panic sets in as the school building is enveloped in barriers. Caligo directs teachers and guards to handle the situation. Aruma, trying to reunite with Clara and Asmodeus, encounters an invisible barrier, realizing it's Amy's barrier technique at play. The night takes a dark turn as the school grapples with unforeseen turmoil, leaving Aruma and his friends in the midst of an unsettling situation. The entire school plunged into chaos, students finding themselves confined within invisible barriers, guards attempting to restore order, and panic spreading like wildfire. In the midst of this madness, Aruma's memory sparks, he recalls a similar wall crafted by Amy. It's deja vu, but way less fun when you're the one stuck in an invisible cage. Meanwhile, Amory, cool as a cucumber, sits in the student council room. Her subordinates burst in, slamming face first into the unseen barrier. Luckily, they manage to locate a gap. Amory, drawing inspiration from a classic first love comic, directs her team to assess the situation calmly and ensure the student's safety. She's as puzzled as the rest of us but channels her inner leader. Robin Sensei, ever the multitasker, munches on a snack while trying to analyze the mysterious barrier. It's like he's enjoying a dinner and a show, all in one invisible cage. Kaligo Sensei, not one to be outdone, unleashes his Cerberabath attack to smash the barrier, only to witness it repair itself instantly. Now, he's pondering the sheer energy required to maintain such a formidable defense. Connecting the dots, Kaligo suspects Principal Sullivan's detention might be linked to this chaos. With Robin in tow, he heads to the management warehouse. Employing the Cerberabath attack again, they breach the barrier, and Kaligo has a light bulb moment. He rings up Dolly Sensei, concocting a brilliant plan. Dolly Sensei takes the stage with a colossal microphone, declaring the chaos as a surprise event by the new magic battler and game battler. The school is now a maze, and students must navigate the invisible walls to reach the central plaza, the ultimate goal. Winners, of course, get fabulous prizes. Caligo and Dolly Sensei manage to bring a temporary sense of calm to the chaos. As the students flood the central plaza, Caligo, now in the management warehouse, dives into the search for the culprits behind this bizarre situation. The school has transformed into a maze, and the quest for answers begins amidst the invisible walls. Dolly Sensei tells Caligo, communication beyond the school's invisible barrier is a no-go. Devilish telecommunication is restricted within this mystical enclosure. With 80% of the students already congregated in the central plaza, Caligo's gears start turning. It dawns on him that gathering everyone in one spot might be Amy's masterstroke, like she's orchestrating a grand finale. Amy's hiding a firework shell in the enhancement apparatus, ready to light up the night. Suddenly, a sharp-eyed Amy spots someone navigating the gaps in the barrier precision. Aruma is on a mission towards the secret room. Asmodeus and Aruma, analyzing the barrier, realize this has been Amy's long-term plan. Aruma reveals his hunch about Amy's whereabouts, asking Asmodeus to chart a course to the elusive third tower on the school map. Asmodeus, the artist, whips out paper and pen, sketching a map of the school. The catch? Tracking all the barriers is no walk in the park for the trio. If only they could control the frogs a la Mamanoki Sensei. The more magic pumped into these soldiers, the harder they work. Asmodeus employs his magic, commanding the soldiers to pinpoint the barrier locations. While Aruma follows Asmodeus' guidance towards the secret room, Kaligo Sensei joins the dots and identifies Amy Kariwo as the culprit. He rallies the other teachers to hunt down Amy. Meanwhile, in the central plaza, chaos ensues as the Magic Beast Circus captivates the students. Amory, being the beacon of responsibility, intervenes just in time to save a student from becoming a stage casualty. As the students wonder about Aruma's whereabouts, he stands outside the secret room, 
poised to uncover the mysteries within. The communication battlers continued their engagement with students, creating a lively chaos throughout the school. Meanwhile, Amri tirelessly searched for Aruma. Outside the secret base, where Amy was executing his master plan, Aruma activated a switch, causing the protected door to open. However, Amy surprisingly let Aruma in. Aruma was taken aback, barely recognizing the calm-looking Amy without his glasses. Amy revealed his enhancement apparatus, which was modifying a firework shell intended to destroy the school. Shocked, Aruma questioned Amy's cruel intentions. Amy then shared his heartbreaking past. Born into the feared and famous Amy clan, known as the Steel Barrier, Amy had little magical power, leading to disappointment from his family. Bullied and beaten at the Correctional Elementary School, the Garden of Delinquents, Amy found solace in a girl who showed him kindness. This girl's lucky charm earring became Amy's source of comfort, but a group of bullies threw it into the river, leaving Amy alone. The joy he felt seeing others in despair became his reason for living. As the revelation unfolded, Urma realized that Amy, the one pinning him down, was a demon, while he himself was human. The true reason for Amy's actions traced back to a past battler party where he met Ball in the magical apparatus battler. Amy had given his horn to the girl as compensation, and Ball revealed his desire to return the netherworld to chaos by eliminating the ranks that governed it. Amy's plan with Ball involved destroying the symbol of ranks, the demon school babbles. Amy allowed Aruma into the room to witness the impending despair of his friends, Asmodeus and Clara. Amy intended to trap Aruma in a box of barriers and relish his fall into despair. However, Aruma, accustomed to despair, remained unfazed. Amy realized that Aruma, who sought to overcome despair, was his natural enemy. In a surprising turn, Aruma removed the firework shell from the enhancement apparatus, determined to defeat Amy. Ignoring Amy's instructions to throw the shell in the central plaza, Aruma initiated a countdown, jumped through the window, summoned Ifrit, and threw the shell towards him. The barrier proved resilient, but Aruma broke the ultimate spell forbidden by Sullivan, shattering the barrier as the firework exploded in the sky. Witnessing Aruma's determination, everyone was impressed. Amy, defeated, saved the sleeping Aruma on the barrier, admitting his defeat. Waking up in Principal Sullivan's lap in the hidden room, Aruma found himself in the midst of an eventful aftermath. Before Aruma entered the secret base to confront Amy, Caligo and Robin were on the rooftop. Robin unleashed his family's bloodline special ability, the bullseye shot, targeting Principal Sullivan. However, Sullivan effortlessly caught the arrow, revealing a message that prompted him to rush towards the school to intervene. The flames of the impending firework disaster were frozen in time by Sullivan, who, along with other teachers, swiftly moved to arrest Amy. Amy, in custody, bid farewell to the chaos, expressing that he had genuinely enjoyed the mischief. Aruma, healed by Sullivan, was shocked to see the principal when he opened his eyes. Sullivan reassured Aruma, explaining that Amy had been arrested and taken into demon border control for interrogation. Despite his misdeeds, Amy's punishment would be relatively light as there were no casualties. Sullivan, carrying Aruma on his shoulder, walked towards an open window, revealing the cheering students enjoying Aruma's fireworks. Handing a microphone to Aruma, Sullivan encouraged him to respond to the students' questions. Asmodeus and Clara approached Aruma, eager to know more about Amy. Unable to provide immediate answers, Aruma promised to share the details later. The party day commenced with a perfect beginning. Over the next two days, students and teachers raided the battlers' exhibits, allowing students to vote for their favorite battlers. Clara's extroverted family arrived at her stall, engaging in lively conversations with Aruma and Asmodeus. They enjoyed food, games, and even sang their special Valak family song before departing. Asmodeus' mother, the Lord of Seduction Thirteen Crowns, arrived after Clara's family left. Asmodeus skillfully evaded his mother, sending her to enjoy other stalls. Feeling left out without a family, Aruma was pleasantly surprised when Principal Sullivan arrived, inviting him to enjoy the festival together. The trio, along with Opera, explored different stalls, with Opera wreaking havoc on businesses with his winning spree. The day concluded with Asmodeus, Aruma, and Clara launching more fireworks, leaving everyone amazed. Opera, laden with gifts, showed no mercy as he headed back. Grateful for Opera and Sullivan, Aruma found happiness in the festivities. The results of the battler's party, eagerly awaited by everyone, were about to be announced, adding to the excitement and anticipation among the students. The ending ceremony unfolded, recognizing excellent battlers with fabulous prizes. The anticipation for the winner of the battler party lingered in the air as Amory took the stage to announce the results. The third place went to succubus battlers, earning them a luxurious room. The second prize was awarded to the new magic battlers, who received a year's supply of black holy water for their magical development. 
As Amory built up suspense for the grand reveal of the first prize, the spotlight suddenly shifted to her. The broadcasters' battlers claimed the top spot, praised for their level-headed broadcasting through every unexpected situation. Sabnok's fury was evident for not securing the first prize. Amid discussions about the magical fireworks that brought joy to Uruma, he hoped for the grand prize for his battlers. As the announcement neared its end, Kaligo sensei seized the microphone, revealing that one student had risked their life without informing the faculty, deserving recognition. To honor this courageous act, a new award was added, the Tricky Award. The magical apparatus battlers were declared the recipients, and Uruma's rank was raised from Bet to Gimel. Uruma, thinking Amy deserved the rank update, experienced a mix of emotions. The students sang the national song of the netherworld, including the terrifying song. Sullivan expressed his pride in Uruma, and suddenly, Everyone wanted to interview him. Unaccustomed to the attention, Aruma's photo appeared in the newspaper. Visiting the student council, Amory, as the president, thanked Aruma for saving the school, and they read a first love comic together. Amory spotted her father outside and left to talk to him. As Aruma was leaving, Henry asked him to follow. Henry, concerned about Aruma's well-being, checked for signs of mistreatment but found none. He revealed that he had met a human before and safely returned them to the human world after erasing their memories of the netherworld. Amory reappeared out of nowhere, introducing herself as Henry's daughter. Henry was shocked by Amory's affections towards Aruma, breaking into a humorous imagination of their wedding ceremony. Amory whisked Henry and Clara away, leaving Asmodeus to join Aruma on his way back to class. The lively and eventful aftermath of the battler party marked the beginning of a new chapter for Aruma and his friends at Babbles. Asmodeus gleefully spreads the newspaper, proudly showcasing Aruma's trickery award win. Aruma's classmates are taken aback, finding his article even bigger than that of Dem Dal Kermo. The confusion sets in, as Uruma remains blissfully ignorant of Kermo's existence. Ever the helpful demon, Asmodeus enlightens Uruma about Demdal, the stress-relieving period where demons indulge in violent or sadistic impulses, termed the evil cycle in demon lingo. Demdals, popular for turning evil into excitement, enjoy a warm reception in the netherworld. Kermo, a cute and talented singer, stands out among them and is holding a day and night concert at Makubari Dome. Jazz spills the beans to Uruma about the high demand for Kermo's concert tickets, sold via lottery. Additionally, lucky fans can meet Kermo in person during a meet and greet after the show. Uruma's classmates are beyond excited, captivated by the charm of Kermo. Amidst this Kermo frenzy, the broadcaster device interrupts, summoning Uruma to the broadcaster's room urgently. Meanwhile, Kermo is gearing up for her performance at Makubari Dome, a legendary venue in the netherworld. In private, she dons her glasses, a stark contrast to her public persona. She feels a bit exposed and embarrassed by her skin, struggling to focus on perfecting her poses due to the distraction of her exposed belly. In a moment of reflection, Kermo revisits a past where she was an average student with low grades and normal magic. Despite her mediocrity, people would stop and gaze in awe whenever she walked by. Kermo, prioritized and shielded from malice, realized the power of cuteness in dispelling violence. Holding a photocopy of the article, she fumes at Aruma for stealing her spotlight. Fueled by rage, she begins unleashing her ice magic. But her manager, Mal San, intervenes to bring her back to reality. Despite the internal turmoil, the audience at Makubari Dome eagerly awaits Kermo's performance. Kiroma, planning to maintain a low profile at school and later aiming to surpass her mother's Zayn rank after graduation, is torn between the fury of competition and the importance of her upcoming concert. The stage is set, the audience is cheering, and Kiroma is determined to make this the most memorable concert of her life. The concert hall pulsates with energy as Kiroma takes the stage, enchanting the audience with her mesmerizing performance. The crowd is captivated, immersed in the magic of her music. Yet, amid the sea of faces, Kiroma's eyes lock onto Aruma, and suddenly, her composure shatters. A few hours prior, Bathin Baraki, the broadcasting battler president, summoned Aruma to the broadcaster's room. Bathin, having secured tickets to Kiroma's concert due to his family's sponsorship, generously handed Aruma, Asmodeus, and Clara the Golden Passes. Aruma, being the lucky recipient, was even granted the coveted meet and greet with the star herself. As Kiroma spots Aruma in her room during the meet and greet, her cool facade crumbles. Despite her efforts to act nonchalant, Kiroma is seething with anger at Aruma, even as he engages in casual conversation. Unwittingly, her cold magic starts to leak out, but she regains control just in time. 
However, her attempt to hide her glasses leads to a chaotic scene as she jumps over Uruma, frantically attempting to keep her identity under wraps. Amidst the chaos, Uruma bids farewell, expressing his anticipation of seeing Kiroma at school. It's at this moment that Kiroma realizes Uruma is already aware of her true identity. Uruma, sharp as ever, had connected the dots. Kiroma, or rather Karali, has distinctive habits, like rolling her hands into fists, a gesture she maintained during her performance. The spilled details from her schedule and the ice magic further unveiled her secret. Uruma, in a surprising twist, confesses his jealousy of Karali's ability to blend in effortlessly. Karali, misunderstanding his intentions, unleashes her ice magic in response. Unfortunately, the strain proves too much for her, and she collapses, succumbing to a fever induced by her own powers. The concert star now lies unconscious, caught in the aftermath of her magical outburst. As Uruma urgently calls for help to attend to Karali, manager Mal swiftly enters the room, finding Karali lying on the couch. Concerned, Mal questions Uruma about any triggering incidents, as Carolee tends to struggle with her head if she becomes too exhausted, emotional, or uses too much ice magic. Their conversation is abruptly interrupted as one of the organizers bursts into the room, panicking about the upcoming concert. Sponsors and fans have flooded the venue, and Kiroma is on the brink of missing her chance to shine. The only hope lies in either a highly skilled doctor or Kiroma's family, both of which seem challenging to secure. Mal rules out calling her family due to the distance and their likely lack of interest in coming to her aid. Suddenly, to everyone's surprise, Carolee wakes up with determination, insisting on going ahead with the performance. She yearns to be the top dem doll, and her family's stoic nature has been a driving force behind her aspirations. Despite the risks, Carolee is resolute about taking the stage. The audience eagerly gathers at the venue, and even Amory, armed with a ticket from her father in charge of concert security, joins the crowd. Kiroma, always desiring to see a smile on her family's faces, was moved by the support. Just when Carolee thought she had missed her moment, the cheers from the crowd reach her ears. Rushing to the stage, she discovers an unexpected scene. Aruma, Asmodeus, and Clara, dressed as Dem Dolls, are stepping up to perform in her place. The trio, determined to save the day, embraces the challenge and takes center stage to entertain the eager audience. The unexpected turn of events transforms the potential disaster into a unique and unforgettable performance, marking a turning point in the tale of the Dem Doll and her unexpected saviors. In a last-ditch effort to salvage the concert, Uruma turned to Asmodeus and Clara for help. Manager Mal initially declined, stating the audience's preference for cute Dem dolls. However, quick-thinking Clara overheard and transformed Asmodeus and Uruma into adorable Dem doll outfits. The trio, now decked out in cute dresses, took the stage, and despite a shaky start, they managed to captivate the audience and generate genuine excitement. Carolee, initially dumbfounded by the unexpected turn of events, learned from manager Mal that Uruma had orchestrated the entire performance to prevent the concert from being cancelled. Touched by this gesture, Carolee decided to join in and performed alongside Uruma, creating an unexpected duo that the audience absolutely loved. The concert turned out to be a massive success, with the audience thoroughly hyped. After the performance, Carolee apologized to the organizers for any inconvenience caused. Manager Mal shared the news that Carolee's family had come to heal her and left a note instructing her to take care of herself. Despite their stoic nature, they had left due to the fear of passing out from excitement, just like Carolee. Uruma, still in awe of Carolee's performance, asked for an autograph. While Carolee remained a bit frustrated, the next day, she discovered their photo in the newspaper, showcasing the unexpected collaboration. Touched by Uruma's kindness and support, Carolee felt a newfound desire to befriend him. The unexpected twists and turns of the concert had not only saved the day but also paved the way for a budding friendship between Uruma and the Dem doll, Carolee. Uruma's getting cozy in the spooky world of demons, the netherworld. Picture this, he wakes up, and the once terrifying surroundings seem oddly serene. As he strolls into the dining room, Sullivan gets a chipper good morning from him. Opera, the demon butler extraordinaire, serves up some hellishly grey tea. And there goes Aruma, enthusiastically devouring his food, oblivious to the shenanigans brewing. In the midst of this demonic breakfast, the cacophony of Clara and Asmodeus reaches Aruma's ears. Meanwhile, Sullivan, in a moment of fatherly consideration, offers Aruma the chance to roll in his favorite carriage. But our protagonist, ever the discerning demon, declines, citing the carriage's excessively spooky horses. Fast forward to the entrance of Babel's school, where Clara throws down the gauntlet, challenging Asmodeus to a race. As the demon duo darts off, Clara can't resist a playful jab at Asmodeus's potential fear of losing. Class time begins, but it's not the usual Caligo sensei at the helm. Instead, Mamanoki sensei steps in, covering for the absent Morex. Basic magic lessons ensue, keeping the demonic curriculum rolling. 
post-class, the students dive into their usual activities. Carolee catches wind of her song topping the Demonican chart, receiving a congratulatory nod from Aruma. Sobnok, in his downtime, plays the Demon King, regurgitating the prophecy about the Foreign Realm's next ruler. Aruma, being the charmer he is, decides to treat Amory to some first love comics. Amory, enchanted by his narration, playfully hints that the character Arumi suspiciously resembles someone she knows. Oblivious, Aruma's left scratching his head at Amory's cryptic remarks. After class, Aruma cruises through his fun-filled life in the netherworld, only to be hit with a revelation. He's seamlessly integrated into this demonic dimension. Shock and realization wash over him like a dark wave. The following day finds Aruma in a contemplative mood, reminiscing about his pre-netherworld days when Sullivan literally dragged him into this supernatural realm. Suddenly, the ever-quirky Clara senses Aruma's melancholy and suggests to Asmodeus that a grand, comforting meal might lift his spirits. Asmodeus, always up for a good time, jumps on board, and the dynamic demon duo heads straight to the campus kitchen for a culinary adventure. Asmodeus finds himself utterly perplexed, staring blankly at Clara's intricate recipe book, deciphering not a single word. His demon ego, however, prevents him from seeking assistance. Suddenly, the atmosphere gets spicy as Clara and Asmodeus engage in a culinary showdown challenging each other to whip up the dish that would capture Aruma's taste buds. Clara dives into the challenge with gusto, attempting to craft the ultimate dish. Feeling the pressure, she's at a loss until her mother makes a dramatic entrance, revealing the secret ingredient, love. With maternal wisdom, Clara's mom guides her through the culinary maze. Meanwhile, Asmodeus, in his corner, is preparing a feast of premium steaks and other delicacies. The culinary clash intensifies, and the next day, both contestants eagerly present their creations to Aruma for the ultimate taste test. Uruma, the lucky food critic, samples both dishes and declares his love for both. This sparks a new skirmish between Clara and Asmodeus, each claiming victory. Seizing the moment, they playfully force-feed Uruma both dishes simultaneously. In a sudden epiphany, Uruma realizes the combination of flavors and suggests that they try it themselves. With Uruma leading the way, they all indulge in the unique taste and in a surprising turn, declare the showdown a draw. Even as a human, Uruma revels in the delights of the netherworld. The next day, as Aruma and his friends head to class with smiles on their faces, Sullivan barges into Aruma's room, ready to wake him up for breakfast. To everyone's shock, Aruma, with newfound boldness, silences Sullivan with a demand to tone down the noise. Sullivan, taken aback by the unexpected change in Aruma's demeanor, can only stare in amazement. The next day, Aruma Kun springs his useless self out of bed, practically bouncing with excitement, like our ugly exes. At the breakfast table, Grandpa works his magic, quite literally, by filling Aruma's plot armor with a dash of enchantment to keep it from feeling lonely like us. With his belly full from a hearty breakfast, Aruma meets up with his pals at the gate. As, ever the fashionista, suggests copying Aruma's hairstyle, but Aruma quickly nixes that idea, much to Az's dismay. Clara, always eager to be helpful, insists on carrying Aruma's bag as they head off to school, drawing envious glances from other demon kids who wish they could enjoy a leisurely stroll like them. Suddenly, Clara goes into turbo mode, racing ahead towards the school, prompting the others to sprint after her. In the garbage room, chaos reigns as trash is strewn everywhere, much to the workers' dismay. But fear not, for Aruma, Clara, and Ez come to the rescue, lending a hand to clean up the mess. Little do they know, their good deed doesn't go unnoticed by their watchful teacher. Once in class, the teacher tells them it's time to buckle their ugly ass and prepare for the dreaded end of term tests. In the next class, they dive into practicing their transformation magic, attempting to change the color of a jarred frog with their spells. Aruma taps into his devil mode magic, chanting the incantation Cherusol, and voila. The frog's hue is magically altered. As lunchtime approaches, as quizzes Aruma on his lunch preferences, while Clara dashes off to snag the coveted W lunch. As hotfoots it after her, determined to prevent any further shenanigans. But just as they're about to dig in, Aruma's ring starts acting up, emitting a mysterious black shadow that sends shivers down his spine. Desperate to keep it under wraps, Aruma engages in a clandestine conversation with the shadow, unaware that they've been spotted by their curious classmates. In a quiet moment in the prep room, the shadow reveals its true purpose, admonishing Aruma for not using his magical powers wisely. It explains that Aruma's imagination is the key to unlocking greater feats of magic, demonstrated by his ability to transform the frog's color simply by envisioning it. With a challenge laid down, Aruma casts a spell on the shadow, morphing it into a fearsome one-eyed devil monster that looks quite similar to our exes. As they banter back and forth, the shadow, now dubbing himself Lil Uru, suggests a new moniker for Uruma. Meanwhile, Amri stumbles upon a surprising sight, a disgusting-looking Uruma gracing the notice board. 
Determined to rectify this fashion faux pas, Aruma tries his hand at a wardrobe change, with disastrous results. It's only when the ring suggests imagining the unimaginable that Aruma ends up in a dress that even catches Amory off guard. And so, amidst the chaos of magical mishaps and fashion faux pas, Aruma attempts to explain to Amory that he was actually practicing magic with his ring, but she dismisses him as delusional for conversing with an inanimate object. Undeterred, Aruma implores the ring's shadow to come forth and clarify things to Amory. However, the ring adamantly refuses, insisting on remaining hidden at all costs. Crushed by the rejection, Aruma's tears start to flow, but the ring offers a glimmer of hope promising to reveal itself if there's any possible way. Feeling at a loss, Aruma considers confiding in his grandpa about the ring's peculiar behavior. However, grandpa's remedy for such concerns involves a comforting glass of milk followed by a soothing opera performance to lull Aruma to sleep. Meanwhile, in the library, Aiko teams up with Gako to devise a plan to capture snapshots of Aruma in action. In the quiet corners of the library, Aruma delves into research about the ring hoping to uncover its mysteries. Yet, when he recounts the incidents caused by the ring, it remains oblivious to them, recalling only the time it led him to encounter Kariwo. Frustrated by the lack of answers, Aruma realizes a pattern. The ring, whom he refers to as Ali Sam, began communicating with him when he reached rank 3. This revelation dawns upon him that as his own rank increases, Ali Sam's abilities also evolve. With newfound clarity, Aruma resolves to elevate his rank further to facilitate Ali Sam's growth. Sullivan, relieved to see Aruma back to his usual self, watches over him with a sense of reassurance. As night falls, Aruma drifts off to sleep, momentarily at peace. However, a lingering concern tugs at his mind, the unresolved misunderstanding with Amory. Meanwhile, Aiko's perseverance pays off as she finally grasps the intricacies of her camera endeavors, setting the stage for many more adventures to come. Comforting, as he sternly declares that if Aruma is the cause of her distress, he will never approve of her dating his useless ass. In school, Amory's mind drifts to thoughts of the manga she enjoys, seeking solace in its pages. With Kariwo, the third-year member, on leave, the battler lacks both a third-year representative and a three-delta member, necessitating a hiatus. However, she assures Aruma of his opportunity to reinstate it later through training and integration with other battlers. As part of this plan, Aruma is assigned to the student council, necessitating his residence in the student dorms. There, they adhere to strict schedules, including grooming, warm-ups, and rigorous council duties. Their training extends to running drills, asserting her authority as the one in charge. Once inside, she instructs Aruma to remove his uniform, surprising him with the request to indulge in reading their beloved manga together. As they immerse themselves in the story, Amory listens intently to Aruma's narration, finding solace in their shared moment. Curious about their motivations, Aruma their unanimous response centers on their admiration for President Amory, praising her tireless dedication and resolve. Amory, observing Aruma's earnest efforts to adapt, acknowledges their praise, affirming their unique qualities. However, their harmonious moment is interrupted by an unexpected announcement summoning Amory to prep room number three. Comes for involving Aruma in the student council, yet once again, she is met with misunderstanding and frustration. In the Demon School of Babels, the student council is tasked with maintaining order among mischievous demons, with Amory serving as its president. However, her sudden transformation from a stern and formidable leader to a gentle and fragile figure leaves everyone perplexed. The council members are baffled by her drastic change, unable to comprehend what could have caused it. Aruma, curious about the mysterious shift in Amory's demeanor, notices a subtle breeze behind a wall, hinting at something amiss. Meanwhile, as troubled by the situation, yearns to support Aruma but finds himself whisked away by his battler comrade. Elsewhere, Smoke expresses concern that Amory needs to return to her former self promptly to fulfill her duties. Despite an investigation by a teacher, it's revealed that the spell cast upon Amory is exceedingly complex, making it challenging to break without her cooperation. The solution? Amory must gradually break free from the spell by adhering to her usual routine. However, the following day brings a stark departure from the norm, as Amory foregoes the usual morning workout in favor of tea and sweets, approaching her duties with an uncharacteristically light-hearted demeanor. This shift leads to a slew of incomplete tasks and disarray within the council. As tensions mount, the council members scramble to uncover the mastermind behind Amory's enchantment. Their investigation leads them to a surprising discovery. Romy Sama, alias Renov Ramery, president of the disciplinary battler, harbors long-standing ambitions to seize control of the student council. 
With Amory rendered powerless, Romery seizes the opportunity to declare war, proposing an election that could dissolve the existing council if they fail to secure victory. Amidst the chaos, Aruma intervenes when Romery barely touches Amory's hair, symbolically thwarting his aggression. Romery departs, leaving the council room adorned with flowers, but the looming threat of his next move hangs heavy in the air. As night falls, the council grapples with uncertainty about Romery's intentions. The following day, their fears are realized as Romery takes to the stage, enticing voters with grandiose promises and delusional offers in his bid for power. As Romery promises the greatest fun time in Babel's ever, excitement ripples through the student body, with hundreds pledging their support. Meanwhile, the student council members fret over Amory's struggle to garner votes, realizing the daunting challenge they face. In the hallway, a demon boy attempts to befriend Az, but his efforts are thwarted when Urumur receives an urgent phone call and rushes off. Meanwhile, chaos ensues in the game battler as Clara wreaks havoc, her antics unchecked until she finally succumbs to sleep. Like clockwork, Uruma reaches out to Clara as well. Contemplating seeking assistance from Kaelgo, Uruma ultimately decides against it. Suddenly, Amory appears and engages him in conversation, providing a moment of respite amidst the chaos. In the common room, Uruma awaits Amory's arrival, only to be confronted by Ali-san, who expresses his discontent at feeling abandoned. Uruma extends a heartfelt apology and seeks his guidance regarding Amory's condition. Ali-san reveals that while he possesses knowledge of a potential solution, the complexity of the spell's effects makes it challenging to unravel. Ali-san likens Amory's condition to a tangled thread, emphasizing the need for a triggering event to initiate the untangling process. Intrigued, Aruma probes for clues, but their discussion is cut short as Amory emerges from her room in her student council uniform. Meanwhile, as exhibits a prickly demeanor towards others, particularly when the conversation turns to Aruma, his loyalty and concern for his friend are evident, even in his brusque interactions with his peers. As Amory emerges from her room in her previous outfit, Aruma's heart swells with excitement, only to realize that she hasn't truly returned to her former self. Shyness washes over her as she meets Aruma's gaze, donning her old uniform in a bid to regain the student's favor. Sitting with Aruma, she expresses gratitude for the efforts of the student council members, but laments that their actions were driven by nostalgia rather than genuine understanding. Conveying her desire to shed the responsibilities of presidency and embrace the life of a regular student, Amory confides in Aruma. However, he gently reminds her that while it may be her ideal, it doesn't align with her true ambitions. He assures her that her worth transcends her title, affirming her inherent beauty and uniqueness. Touched by his words, Amory stands up with renewed determination, seeking Aruma's unwavering support. In the hallways, Clara and Az embark on their respective missions to uncover the culprit behind Amory's enchantment, spurred on by Aruma's directive. Meanwhile, Aruma delves into researching matter-altering magic, hoping to uncover clues that may aid their investigation. On election day, Romery dazzles the crowd with his energetic performance, captivating the devil students with his charisma. As Amory takes the stage, however, her nerves betray her, leading to mockery and disinterest from the audience. Undeterred, Amory musters her resolve, rallying the crowd with her vision of elevating babbles to greatness. Her impassioned speech resonates with the students, swaying them to her side. As she extends a heartfelt apology to those she may have wronged, a familiar face emerges from the crowd, hinting at a revelation yet to come. In the midst of the crowd, Amory locks eyes with Aruma, finally realizing her true feelings for him. As the election concludes, Romery is disheartened by the prospect of dissolving his battler. However, Aruma, accompanied by Az and Clara, arrives to reveal the true culprit, second-year student Oligoth Chanel, whose obsession with Amory led him to manipulate events in an attempt to see her in a more Leda-like light. Amory administers punishment to Oligoth, compelling him to fulfill his duties 50 times over. She expresses gratitude to useless Az and Clara for their assistance, extending an offer of membership in the student council to Romery as a gesture of reconciliation. Additionally, she permits Aruma to reinstate his magical apparatus battler and extends an invitation for him to officially join the student council battler. However, Aruma declines, opting to pursue his own ambitions and requesting the return of his friends to his battler, a request which Amory grants. Later, at home, Aruma converses with Amory over the phone, where she expresses how much everyone misses him in the student council battler. Meanwhile, Ali-san emerges from the ring, praising Aruma's girlfriend, referring to Amory, though Aruma quickly silences him. Reflecting on Amory's behavior, Aruma ponders the object of her fixation, wondering if it was her desire to appear cute in his eyes. Simultaneously, Amory blushes as she grapples with her newfound realization of her feelings for Aruma, making it one of her ambitions. She wonders if Aruma is ready for what lies ahead. Meanwhile, Aiko finds herself in a state of confusion 
confusion, torn between her feelings for Uruma, the charming president, and the admirable qualities of Amory. Lost in her thoughts, she retreats into her own world. Upon returning from the student council, Uruma finds Sullivan organizing a welcome party for him every day, extending invitations to his friends as well. As Uruma hesitates to send the invitation message, Ollie San startles him, causing him to accidentally hit send. Quickly, Aruma's friends, As and Clara, confirm their attendance. With the party underway, As brings greetings from his mother while Clara relays hellos from her numerous siblings. Before they can exchange gifts, Clara presents Aruma with a demango, containing a thrilling surprise, a monster. Gathered around the dining table, they indulge in a feast prepared by opera, interrupted only by her suggestion to start with a gaming session. The gaming console launches into a dancing game, challenging them to outdo the operator. Engaging in lively dance-offs, they navigate through the game's obstacles, with Opera emerging as the victor, followed by Az, Clara, Aruma, and Sullivan, who humorously laments his last place finish. Determined to redeem himself, Sullivan proposes a game of dark parade in the mansion's basement. As they venture into the dimly lit corridors, Sullivan secretly arranges for a faux monster encounter, only to be surprised when Az and Clara easily dispatch it with their magic. Undeterred, Aruma urges them to continue the dark parade, leading them to a mysterious hallway. Unbeknownst to them, it holds memories from Sullivan's childhood, revealed with the help of Opera. However, their exploration is interrupted by the emergence of a real monster from behind the boxes, signaling the start of an unexpected adventure. As Az summons his familiar to combat the monster, it becomes evident that the creature easily overpowers fire-based attacks. However, Sullivan discerns that the monster is merely a projection orchestrated by Opera. Stepping into the fray, Sullivan swiftly dispatches the illusion, earning praise from the children. Their attention then turns to a treasure box, which Aruma opens to reveal a delightful treat crafted from the Demango and fruit brought by his friends. Impressed by Opera's ingenuity, Sullivan commends her efforts, declaring the treat as their reward for reaching the deepest depths. Grateful for the gesture, Aruma, Az, and Clara express their appreciation, relishing the dessert as Sullivan remains contemplative. During dessert, Aruma invites Clara and Az to linger a while longer, leading them to his room where they enjoy playing together. Bid farewell at the gate, they promise to return, leaving Aruma feeling content. Returning to Sullivan, Aruma expresses gratitude for the memorable day. That night, Ali San engages Aruma in conversation, noting his struggles with understanding Amory's transformation and the concept of the evil cycle. Seeing Aruma's perseverance, Ali San decides to intervene, nudging Aruma towards a solution. Aruma, in turn, casts a spell on Ali San, transforming him into a mischievous character. The next morning, Sullivan and Opera visit Aruma's room with a glass of milk. At least one of our father came back with the milk only to be taken aback by Aruma's disrespectful demeanor. Perplexed by his sudden change in behavior, Aruma Kun awakens under Ali San's spell, exhibiting disrespectful behavior towards his loving grandpa, leaving everyone perplexed by the sudden change. At breakfast, his mood remains sour, evident from his demeanor towards Sullivan. Handing his bag to Az and criticizing Clara, Aruma's behavior continues to baffle those around him. As they arrive at school, his classmates are taken aback by his uncharacteristic conduct. Concerned classmates turn to Clara for an explanation, who reveals that Aruma is experiencing an evil cycle characterized by heightened aggression and extreme tendencies due to Ali San's spell. Aruma's erratic behavior escalates when he calls Clara to sit on his lap. Led by Aruma's peculiar scent, the misfit class ventures outside, where they encounter a garbage dump. Aruma uses his magic to conjure a massive black shadow, declaring his intent to transform the misfit class into a castle. Their unexpected display of power leaves ordinary students awestruck and hesitant to challenge them. A confrontation ensues in the hallway when a demon boy disrespects Aruma behind his back, only to stumble in his presence, facing the powerful ranked misfit class. Aruma decides to forgive his useless ass, but tells him that next time, say it to his face. In Kaligo's office, Aruma articulates his demands for improved facilities for the misfit class, highlighting the unacceptable conditions of their current classroom, saying they haven't did shit. But Kaligo pulls out the motherfricking fact book on their useless asses, and lists about every dang troublesome act these motherfrickers have done. You obviously can't forget this perverted ass owl, who actually needs to be at the bottom of the entire demon school. Aruma basically said forget the facts and demands to put in the royal classroom, previously occupied by the lost demon king, Durkilla, as a solution to their plight. Undeterred, Aruma defiantly challenges Caligo, vowing to secure signed permission from every faculty member to utilize the prestigious royal classroom for the misfit class. Although Caligo initially offers a week for this task, Aruma negotiates and accepts the challenge within three days. Outside Caligo's office, curious normal students attempt to eavesdrop, 
prompting Aruma to remind them of proper garbage disposal etiquette. Meanwhile, Caligo faces scrutiny from the faculty, who question his decision to promise the royal classroom. Despite the botany teacher's eagerness to support the idea, Caligo imposes punishment, basically saying I wish your green leprechaun self would try me, highlighting the uphill battle awaiting Aruma and his classmates. Feeling daunted by the seemingly insurmountable task ahead, the misfit class accompanies Aruma to the gates of the royal room, marveling at its grandeur. Aruma reminds them of their involvement in Romeri's election, leveraging their support as prime candidates for the classroom. Describing the room's amenities, including a gaming area and a soundproof chamber, Aruma rallies their excitement, urging them to embrace the opportunity for popularity and success. With renewed determination, the misfit class pledges their commitment to reclaiming their rights. Aruma points Andro M. Jazz as their vanguard and reassures Iko that, despite his altered behavior, his eating habits remain unchanged. As they embark on their mission to secure the royal classroom, Aruma and his classmates vow to cause significant disruptions, determined to assert their rightful place within the school. Aruma decides to delegate the task of being the vanguard to none other than Andro M. Jess. Meanwhile, Caligo is peacefully minding his own business in his office when he's suddenly disturbed by some commotion. Venturing out, he discovers the botany teacher gleefully stomping on permission letters. Little does Caligo know, Aruma is scheming to pilfer some of his possessions. After some plotting, Aruma, accompanied by Andro, confronts Caligo. In a bold move, Aruma confesses that obtaining Caligo's stamp on the permission letter seemed as unlikely as finding a unicorn, so they opt for Plan B, borrowing it from his trusty familiar. This declaration sparks a fiery debate between Caligo and Aruma. Andro unveils his secret weapon, his magical ability to peer into Caligo's robes, revealing the coveted stamp. With a flick of his serpent-like fingers, Andro effortlessly retrieves the stamp, much to the relief of Aruma and himself. However, their relief is short-lived as Caligo intercepts them in the hallway, sending shivers down their spines. Thankfully, Caligo surprises them by requesting Aruma return the familiar stamp, diffusing the tense atmosphere. As they part ways, Andro discreetly pulls out a tiny diary, hinting at his knack for secrets. Their next stop, Mamanoki, where they present Caligo's planner, uncovering juicy tidbits about his feelings towards fellow instructors. Unable to resist the temptation, Mamanoki gladly stamps the permission letter, setting the ball rolling for their mission. Their journey continues as they seek the approval of other instructors. Aloser Schneider, the academic ace, swiftly resolves magical knowledge instructor Ferkus's dilemma, earning them another stamp. Meanwhile, two demon classmates charm magical knowledge instructor Morax into signing the permission letter by citing Ferkus's endorsement. Elsewhere, Agars, Pysro, and Gop Sweet talk Susie into granting them three signed permission letters after smoothing out her land. As, accompanied by Jazz, seeks assistance from a senior, trading fiery secrets for juicy gossip about the teachers. Back at school, Aruma receives heartening news from an old caretaker about Susie's delight in the cleared fields. Reunited with Az, Clara, and Andro, Aruma rejoices at the collection of stamps they've amassed. However, his reluctance to aid the old helper exposes a glimpse of his darker side, leaving Az and Andro taken aback. In Sullivan's abode, a decision is made to restore the good-natured Aruma who surprises everyone by promptly requesting Sullivan's signature on the permission letter, to which Sullivan readily obliges, sealing their triumph. Later at the dinner table, when Sullivan requests a photo, Aruma initially declines, but then surprises everyone by suggesting a group selfie. Meanwhile, Aiko stumbles upon Aruma buried under a mountain of permission letters. Emerging from the paperwork, Aruma proudly announces that they've amassed 21 stamps but still need 15 more, excluding Caligo's elusive stamp. Concerned about potential resistance from instructors due to Caligo's disapproval, the group strategizes their next moves. The challenge lies in securing stamps from the formidable astrology instructor Oria's Oswald and the enigmatic healing arts instructor viewer Blashenko. Lyde and Elisabetta devise a cunning plan to coax a stamp out of Oria's by challenging him to a game. Meanwhile, Sabnok faces off against Blashenko in a physical duel for his stamp. Not to be outdone, Aruma decides to leverage the support of the student council to sway reluctant instructors. He swiftly contacts Amory for assistance. Clara concocts a diabolically difficult game for the gaming challenge, featuring strict rules and dance intervals to test Oria's skills. Despite sensory bundits' attempts to blind him, Oria's employs clever strategies to gain the upper hand. Meanwhile, Blashenko asserts his invincibility due to his self-healing abilities. However, Sabnak humbly apologizes for his past aggression and acknowledges Aruma's influence on his newfound compassion, ultimately earning Blashenko's respect and stamp. 
Aruma persuades Amri to sign the permission letter by appealing to the Misfit class's quest for justice. With Amri's signature secured, the group gathers in the Misfit classroom, exhilarated by their collection of 36 stamps. As the final hurdle, Mamanoki returns Kaligo's planner, inadvertently tipping him off to the Misfit scheme. Kaligo's smug grin at the realization brings joy to Mamanoki's heart. Amri, Blashenko, and Oriya's graciously hand over their signed permission letters to Aruma, marking the culmination of their efforts. With all faculty signatures except one, Robin confronts Kaligo about his intentions. However, Kaligo has a different plan brewing. Near the garden, the old janitor marvels at Aruma's flourishing plant seedlings, a testament to his care. Meanwhile, in Kaligo's office, the misfit class proudly displays their collection of signatures, eagerly anticipating their move to the royal room. They implore Kaligo to sign the permission letters, but he sets a challenging condition. Kaligo demands that Aruma obtain signatures from every staff member at Babbles, including cafeteria and janitorial staff. The misfit students are crestfallen, but Kaligo insists it's his duty to safeguard Babbles from potential dangers. Suddenly, a knock interrupts their conversation, and the old janitor enters, presenting a signed permission letter. To their surprise, he rallies all the other staff members who enter with their own signed letters, expressing gratitude to Uruma for his past assistance. Moved by their gestures, Kaligo finally stamps the permission letter, granting the misfit class entry into the royal room. On the day of the grand opening, a multitude of students gathers to witness the event. Orias commends the misfits for transforming their reputation from oddballs to exemplary students, drawing admiration from their peers. However, when Orias inquires about Aruma's whereabouts for the gaming battle, Agar somberly reveals that Aruma's participation is impossible. Instead, Aruma retreats to the food stall, where a lavish feast awaits him. Despite the astonishment of his peers, Aruma's insatiable appetite reveals glimpses of his dark past, leaving everyone bewildered yet intrigued. As excitedly informs Aruma that they've finally won the royal classroom, but Aruma humbly corrects him, emphasizing that it's the entire misfit class's victory. As the opening ceremony commences, Kaligo makes his grand entrance. Aruma queries whether Kaligo secured permission from the chairperson, per Sullivan's advice to make the ceremony memorable. Kaligo unlocks the seal and recounts the classroom's history, revealing it was originally prepared for a demon of unmatched prowess named Urkilasama. With the heavy keys ceremoniously turned by instructors, the gates to the royal classroom swing open, and the misfit class eagerly rushes inside, awestruck by its regal splendor. Amidst their admiration, Aruma boldly claims the throne-like chair, symbolizing their triumph. However, the following morning, the spell cast by Ali San wears off, returning Aruma to his normal self. Concerned by his previous behavior, Aruma confronts Ali San before seeking forgiveness from his grandfather, as Clara and Amory. Despite Amory's initial tension, she quickly forgives Aruma, recognizing his remorse. In the royal classroom, Aruma apologizes to his classmates for his past actions, but they assure him of their support and happiness for their collective achievement. In a touching moment, Aruma, now back in his throne, captures a memorable picture with Kaligo and his classmates. Meanwhile, in the garden, the seedling planted by Aruma blooms into a beautiful blue flower, symbolizing growth and renewal. As the festivities continue, Sullivan and Opera snap pictures with Aruma, expressing appreciation for both his reformed self and his former mischievous persona. Despite the changes, they fondly acknowledge the complexity of Aruma's character, embracing all facets of his identity. Ever since Aruma stepped foot into the demon world, he's faced numerous challenges. However, none seem as daunting as the prospect of studying. When he encounters Az and Clara at school, Clara clings to Aruma, much to the bewilderment of their classmates in the royal classroom. Aruma realizes Clara's attachment stems from her fear of him reverting to his mischievous ways. Despite their classmates' attempts to persuade her otherwise, Clara remains steadfast in her determination to stick by Aruma's side. Eventually, their classmates join in, creating a comical scene of everyone clinging to Aruma. Their moment is interrupted by Kaligo, who announces that their classes have been shortened in preparation for the upcoming end of Terminus exams. This period marks the end of the term, where students either return home or focus on battler training during the vacation. However, Kaligo warns them of the looming classroom exams and the consequences of failing supplementary classes. The misfit class is filled with anxiety at the thought of these exams, particularly Uruma, who confides in Az and Clara about his struggles with studying. Despite Clara's blunt assessment of his academic abilities, they resolve to work together to prepare for the exams. Just as they're strategizing, Amory assigns Chanel to Aruma, tasking him with keeping an eye on her. 
However, Clara and Az's antics inadvertently lead to Chanel joining the magical apparatus battler group, complicating matters for Aruma. Az warns Aruma about the consequences of failing the end of Terminus exams, which could lower his rank. Meanwhile, at home, Grandpa frets over Aruma's test scores, but Opera insists on letting him tackle the exams independently, believing in his potential. In his room, Ali-san expresses gratitude to Aruma for his kindness, to which Aruma promises to do his best not to fail. Meanwhile, Az and Clara are astonished to find the misfit class diligently studying in the royal classroom. However, Sabnok and Karori opt out of immediate study sessions, believing that rushing leads to mistakes. Undeterred, Aruma, Az, and Clara embark on their study session together. Unfortunately, both Aruma and Clara falter in the quiz portion. Their struggles continue in the Magic Basics quiz, where despite their efforts, Aruma fails to select the correct answer. In the astrology class, Az poses a question to Aruma, who seeks Clara's assistance. However, Clara's answer is incorrect, prompting Az to step in and provide the correct one. Conversely, Clara excels in the pharmaceutics class, impressing her classmates with her knowledge. Attempting to reciprocate, Clara challenges Aruma with a question, resulting in a noisy exchange that draws concern from their classmates. Suddenly, the zoology book before Aruma transforms, gaining limbs and becoming animated. It quizzes Aruma on human-related topics, to which he flawlessly responds, earning cheers from his peers. Encouraged by their success, they delve into netherworld history, with Aruma eagerly agreeing to learn more. However, their plans take an unexpected turn when they attempt to attend Dolly Sensei's class, only to be ensnared in mysterious green threads upon meeting Balam Sensei. In a lighter moment, Chanel concocts a potion to enhance Aruma's intelligence, but inadvertently transforms Clara instead, as implores Chanel to rectify the situation and restore Clara to her former self. Balam kicks off his lesson on imaginary beasts in the Netherworld History Room painting a vivid picture of their carnivorous tendencies, likening them to a demon cat feasting on a demon bird. Uruma, now enlightened, understands why students avoid Balam due to his propensity for touchy-feely experiments. Balam's habit of selecting students for experiments based on his touch adds an eerie aura to his lectures. Demonstrating with a dummy human, Balam probes the class about their hypothetical reactions to encountering a human. Most express a desire to consume the human, but one student inquires about Balam's response. Surprisingly, Balam reveals he'd inquire about the human's survival methods sparking a discussion on demon evolution and wing production. However, Balam's attention turns to Uruma when he realizes he lacks wings. Seizing Uruma, Balam rushes to the teacher's staff room to showcase this anomaly. Upon inspection, they discover wing-like appendages, courtesy of Ali-san's magic. Mistaking them for small wings, the teachers brush off the misunderstanding. Deciding to steer clear of Balam, Uruma is startled when Balam reveals he's diagnosed him with a mysterious ailment or deemed him a unique creature. Removing his face mask to reveal his fangs, Balam shares his own vulnerability, explaining his fear of ridicule. In a moment of candor, Uruma confesses his humanity, shocking Balam. Recalling his own childhood experiences of being teased for his fascination with humans, Balam struggles to comprehend Uruma's revelation. He quizzes Aruma about wings or tails, only to receive a negative response, further deepening the mystery surrounding Aruma's identity. Balam, still reeling from the revelation about Aruma's humanity, retreats behind a wooden box, urging Aruma to keep his distance. However, when Aruma innocently touches him, Balam's startled reaction causes him to stumble and fall. Expressing concern, Balam admits that other demons might not react kindly if they discovered Aruma's secret. Aruma confides in Balam, admitting his exhaustion from hiding his true nature and his desire to share his secret with someone. Moved by Aruma's vulnerability, Balam launches into a lengthy lecture on the importance of protecting his human identity, offering guidance and support. Returning to the classroom, Aruma finds his classmates exhausted from their end of terminus preparations. They decide to split the class into groups based on academic performance, but as, preoccupied with supporting Aruma, declines to participate in teaching. Curious about Babel's vacation, Aruma listens eagerly as his classmates describe the exciting adventures awaiting them, from amusement parks to water parks and shopping sprees. Overwhelmed with happiness, Aruma sheds tears of joy at the prospect of such fun-filled activities. However, Caligo interjects, reminding them that passing their exams is a prerequisite for enjoying the vacation. He also announces his role as supervisor for supplementary classes, emphasizing the importance of diligence in their studies. Contemplating the idea of cheating to pass the exams, Aruma seeks advice from Jazz, who warns him of the risks involved, citing the high likelihood of cheaters getting caught. Suddenly, Balam Sensei arrives in the classroom, greeted warmly by Caligo. 
Balam informs Uruma that he's come to check on him and offer assistance with the exams, launching into a tale about three siblings as a means of imparting wisdom and guidance. As the end of Terminus exams conclude, Caligo wastes no time in announcing the results, catching the students off guard. However, to their delight, Caligo reveals that none of them need to attend supplementary classes. The students erupt in cheers and jubilation at the news, relieved to be spared from additional studying. Further adding to their excitement, Caligo announces that those with good grades will advance from Aleph to Bet. To everyone's surprise, Aruma receives special recognition for showing the greatest improvement. Eager to share his achievement, Aruma rushes to inform Balam Sensei, only to be taken aback by Balam's new hairstyle. Balam attributes his bold change to Uruma's encouragement and presents him with a salamander flower, capable of spitting fire. Balam explains that with Uruma's newfound knowledge, he can control the flames from the flower. Moved by Uruma's support, Balam credits him for inspiring his transformation. Meanwhile, the misfit class rejoices at the prospect of avoiding supplementary classes. In a hallway encounter, Caligo stops Balam Skikro and acknowledges him as one of the few demons with a Ket rank, second only to Caligo himself. Balam Skikro's unique ability to detect false falsehoods intrigues Caligo, who envisions utilizing it to maintain order among the students. However, Balam reveals that there's still one student he can't read, much to the misfit's delight. While Amri eagerly awaits Uruma with special hell tea, Clara interrupts with news that Uruma won't be joining them. Instead, Clara leads Uruma to an exclusive girls-only gathering, where they indulge in girl talk over the special tea. Amri and Karori discuss shampoo preferences, with Karori revealing her identity as the famous Dem doll Kiramu. When asked about her routine, Clara surprises them all by admitting to using only soap for both her body and hair, sparking laughter and camaraderie among the girls. As the girls indulge in shampoo discussions, they generously offer their own selections to Clara. Meanwhile, the boys revel in a lively party filled with singing and dancing with Uruma even treating everyone to a song that delights the crowd. While the girls delve into discussions about relationships, Clara admits her fondness for Uruma, sparking surprise and jealousy among her friends. Amri, taken aback by Clara's confession, offers advice on initiating contact with boys based on her own experiences. When asked about her crush, Karori conceals her feelings for Uruma, prompting further inquiries from her curious friends. Clara, attempting to defuse the tension, declares her affection for everyone in the class. However, her friends push further, questioning if she loves Uruma enough to consider marriage leading to a spirited debate on various relationship milestones. The heated argument, fueled by the effects of the hell relaxation tea, eventually dissipates as the girls reconcile and praise each other's qualities. They exchange contact information for future gatherings, solidifying their newfound friendship. Upon Aruma's unexpected entrance, the girls assert their desire to continue their girls' only time, prompting Aruma's departure with a playful rejection. In a light-hearted twist, as informs Aiko of Aruma's hard work, inspiring Aiko to simplify formulas to aid Aruma's understanding. Unexpectedly, Aiko's efforts propel her into the top 10 positions, a delightful outcome of her dedication. Sullivan eagerly anticipates the summer break, while Opera, having aided him in becoming a beloved grandfather figure, approaches him with a special request. Whispering her wish into his ear, Opera leaves Sullivan intrigued. Meanwhile, Caligo tends to his demon plants, looking forward to some relaxation. However, his tranquility is disrupted by ominous thunderclouds, sparking his suspicion. During a staff meeting, Sullivan announces his intention to conduct home visits to the misfit students. Caligo, initially dismayed by the prospect, begrudgingly complies with the chair demon's directive. His first visit takes him to Az's home, where he discovers that Az hasn't informed his parents about the visit. As Caligo discusses Az's academic performance, Az redirects the conversation to praise Aruma. Caligo urges Az to focus on himself, but Az's attention remains fixated on Aruma. Observing Az's obsession with Aruma, Caligo listens as the old butler sheds light on Az's transformation since Aruma's arrival. Recognizing Az's potential, Caligo acknowledges that his dedication to Aruma may hinder his own growth. After a lengthy discussion with the butler, Caligo departs for Clara's home. Welcomed warmly at the door, Caligo is taken aback by the sight of Clara and her family holding welcome cards. Initially hesitant to enter, Caligo finds himself pulled inside by Clara and her siblings, who entertain him with dancing and singing. However, their festivities are interrupted by Clara's elder brother, who reprimands them for bothering their teacher. Despite Clara's mischievous nature, Caligo acknowledges her uniqueness and generosity to her family, reflecting on her impact at school. As Caligo visits various students' homes, he witnesses different family dynamics and encounters unique situations. At Clara's home, her family's considerate nature prompts Caligo to acknowledge that Clara has the potential to excel as a demon student. 
Leaving Clara's home with gift bags in tow, Caligo proceeds to spar with Garp Dojo's father and deals with Jazz's brother attempting to pilfer his wallet at Jazz's residence. Meanwhile, at Agars's home, Caligo struggles to wake Agars from his slumber while at another student's home, he finds himself constantly offered food. Arriving at Sullivan's home, Caligo eagerly seeks out Sullivan, only to be interrupted by Opera, who asserts her seniority over Caligo. Sullivan reminisces about Caligo's rowdy student days, where he was unfairly blamed for trouble caused by Opera. Upon discovering Opera's role in the past incidents, Caligo confronts her, but she insists on her authority over him. During their meeting, Sullivan inquires about Aruma's performance, prompting Caligo to remark on Aruma's knack for navigating various challenges. As Caligo prepares to depart, Opera arrives with supplies and changes Caligo's familiar's color to pink. In the aftermath of Caligo's school visits, he assigns the misfit class a hefty amount of homework as punishment. Meanwhile, during summer vacation, Aruma is unsure of his plans until Clara and Az invite him to join them and the other misfit students at the water park. Sullivan, sensing Aruma's uncertainty, packs him provisions and encourages him to seek help when needed. In a humorous twist, Opera attempts to filter out unnecessary items from Aruma's supplies, only for Sullivan to decide to accompany Aruma himself, ensuring an unexpected adventure awaits. There was this grumpy old demon king who'd been working his tail off for 30 straight days. But then, hallelujah, summer break arrived, and everyone could finally kick back and relax. So, picture this, all the students are chilling in their casual gear, ready to enjoy the sunshine. At the entrance of Walter Park, you've got Caligo, Balam, and Opera hanging out, thanks to orders from Sullivan. But Caligo's like, nah, not feeling the Opera vibe. Meanwhile, the misfit crew is fawning over Balam's fresh new do. Aruma's wondering where Aloser went, and Jazz fills him in. Conference time with Fergus. Amri's psyched because Aruma invited her out, but turns out, it's not a date date. Bummer. Then, boom, the door swings open, and in swoops a Joker bird welcoming them to Fantasy City. They hear about a Dem Doll concert going down and wonder if mysterious Kirimu-chan will make an appearance. Clara's all set to bust out her costume, but Urum is like, hold up, no Dem Dolls here. They try to pick a game but get overwhelmed by all the options, so they decide to split up. Instructors ain't having it though, only three of them to keep an eye on these troublemakers. Clara suggests a competition to see who can have the most fun, with the instructors treating the winners. Caligo's not having it, though. He lays down the law, losers do triple homework duty. Az is gunning to be on Aruma's team again, and Opera's like, let fate decide. But wouldn't you know it, Az and Aruma end up together anyway. Balam's supposed to keep an eye on them, while Opera gets stuck with the girl squad. Caligo winds up with the sobbiest bunch of misfits you ever did see. Clara's dead set on sticking with Aruma, but Amri's playing defense on that one. So, Clara's eyeing Amri's dress with envy, but Amri spills the beans, it's all thanks to Elizabeth's fashion advice. With that settled, they're off to deck out Amri. Meanwhile, Caligo's team is lost in indecision on how to have fun. Caligo's about to lose it with all their whispering until they all rush him with noise. He's forced to call for some peace and quiet. Aruma's crew, on the other hand, can't even decide where to start. Aruma's bouncing around like a kid in a candy store, thinking he's stumbled upon the party of the year. Turns out, it's just Renov putting on his own little show. Aruma's like, hey, how's the park treating you? And Renov's all like, oh, you know, just enjoying the perks of being the boss's kid. But his fun gets cut short when Yuitoto, the designated Renov watcher, steps in. Dude can't keep from wreaking havoc on the park. Meanwhile, Aruma's team still stuck in decision paralysis when Renov suggests they check out the park's basement, a secret prison, no less, hidden beneath the merry rides. Balam's not having it as the responsible chaperone, and Az is quick to second that notion. Aruma wisely agrees. Down in the depths, the prisoners are seething with envy at the joy above ground. Kariwo, the unlucky soul who tried to mess with Babbles, is now stuck doing hard labor. But there's a glimmer of hope, a secret plan to break free, with some outside help from the Musaskino crew. And guess who's the mastermind? Yep, Kariwo. While the misfits are living it up, the prisoners are plotting to wreck the park. Amidst all the chaos, Amory is on the line with Elisabetta, desperately seeking fashion advice for her not-a-date date. Elisabetta's got stories for days about the latest trends, keeping the adventure rolling along. So, the misfits divide into three teams for a fun showdown. The girls hit up the outfit store and pick out a stunning dress for Amory. But Clara's got her own fashion statement going on, a dress that's basically a tent. Thankfully, a master tailor steps in to preach the gospel of body shapes and sizes. Meanwhile, Caligo's living the good life, surrounded by treats like a king on his throne. Two demon boys come begging for cash, but Caligo's all, nah, you're on your own. 
Instead, they challenge them to a SmackDown game where the winner takes all. Just when Jazz is about to nail the target, a skeleton crashes the party. After some epic struggle, they manage to have a blast and snap some picks. But then they decide to venture where no team has gone before, Kararagi Street. Kaligo's quick to shut that down though, cause that street's all about shady magical dealings. Meanwhile, Uruma's living it up on the rides until Renov starts playing tag. One wrong turn later, Uruma's lost in Kararagi Street, with no signal and no crew in sight. Renov clues in the gang, and they realize Uruma's gone off the grid. Cut to Uruma getting ambushed by a robot demon, only to be rescued by a mystery girl who whisks him away to the real amusement park. She drops some wisdom about not looking back and treats him to ice cream before hitting the rides together, even snapping a pick for the gram. Back with the gang, they're worried sick about Uruma's whereabouts. Turns out, a girl saved him, but she's vanished into thin air. Shida Kun, one of the Walter staff, is on the case. Meanwhile, Uruma calls Amri to break the news about his little detour. But before he can reunite with the gang, he overhears some kids talking about the notorious Six Fingers, an organization hell-bent on bringing back the demon's terrifying reputation. Aggers whines about being tired, blaming his mask, so he ditches it. So, Aggers shocks everyone with his big, sparkly honey eyes, talk about a makeover waiting to happen. Renov takes it upon himself to give Aggers a glow up and drags him off to a makeover session. Meanwhile, Watoto's itching to report back to headquarters, leaving the misfits in Balam's capable hands. After briefing the boss, Shida pulls Watoto aside and gives the signal, everyone's ready to roll. Watoto spills the beans, they're gearing up for an attack, Six Fingers style. The crew includes Mermero, Atori, Mickey, Huterin, Shida, and of course, Watoto himself. Their mission, cause chaos to bust their buddy Karori out of prison. And they're not holding back, this plan involves blowing up the park and wreaking havoc. On the lighter side, Uruma's chatting it up with Shida, who's planning to adopt a demon chick named Captain Poncho for some reason. Uruma's not sure if that name screams tough, but hey, to each their own. So, the Six Fingers are ready to unleash chaos in the amusement park, but just as they're gearing up, Aggers, snoozing on a cloud, takes a tumble. Turns out, he's got this neat trick where he can mess with the ground. He senses something's up, it's warmer than usual. He spills the beans about these three eggs that keep the park safe with their mana. As they're mulling over their next move, boom. A colossal crimson dragon crashes the party. The Walter Park crew scrambles to evacuate everyone. In the control room, they spot three demon monsters wreaking havoc in different spots. Kaligo's like, alright, team, let's channel our mana and take down that big bad beast. But his crew's like, uh, sorry boss, we missed a how to attack memo. Kamui steps in to translate the beast's growls, but before they can react, a giant rock comes hurtling their way. Garp whips out his wind blade and slices that rock like a hot knife through butter. They regroup and hatch a plan to blindside the beast by stealing one of its eyes. They launch their attack, but the beast ain't going down without a fight. It charges right at them, ready to squish him like bugs. The misfits make a mad dash to Caligo for guidance, but he's too busy buried in his plans. His advice, use everything they've learned in class. Back in the control room, the Walter Park safety crews at a loss against the beasts. Meanwhile, down in the prison, carrero has gone and freed all the demons hell-bent on bringing even more chaos to the park. A guard sends word that the prisoners from level 2 are on the loose, making a beeline for the park. But one of them stops and warns about facing off against Triton, the big boss security guard. And wouldn't you know it, Triton's getting schooled by some little punk. Chaos truly reigns supreme. Down on the ground, Jazz's pals are pushing him to take on the beasts, but he's dodging their attacks like a pro. They're counting on him, especially since he's got that fancy Gimel rank. Jazz reminisces about his brothers, who were supposed to be role models but turned out to be total train wrecks. Booze and babes were their jam. Now it's up to Jazz to step up and save the day. Caligo saunters over and calls Jazz out, asking if that thing around his neck is just for show. Meanwhile, Arum is watching in horror as the park gets wrecked in record time. He catches wind of a possible plot behind the chaos. Balam's theory, these beasts were summoned for sure. A demon kid's crying for help, and while everyone else hesitates, Uruma dashes in to save the day, until the Walter safety guard slaps him with a hold up, kiddo. Uruma snags as his phone to check out their group pick and realizes he's been stewing in anger for nothing. In a lighter moment, as snaps some shots of Uruma rocking his monster cosplay and shares them with the gang, praising his killer look. Aiko's so impressed she makes it her new phone background. Ah, the power of a good photo opus. Breaking news from the netherworld, three nasty beasts, a fiery dragon, a sneaky rat, and a bullish mountain brute have crashed the party. Uruma swoops in to save a kid, realizing all the ice cream and rides were a blast and worth protecting. 
As in the gang rally behind him, meanwhile, Opera is on a mission to shield those close to Aruma. She orders the girls to scram and takes on the beast herself. Surprisingly, she's holding her own. Amri pops back, having sent everyone else to safety with Valak. Now they're teaming up against the monster, only to find Valak hitching a ride on a demon's tail. Over in another corner, Kamui's enlisted a flock of demon crows to join the fray. Lead tries to swipe the beast's sensors, but it's a pain in the butt, literally. They're all following Jazz's master plan, but even Garp's struggling to put up a fight. Jazz, though, has a trick up his sleeve, literally. He's clinging to the beast's ear, ready to unleash his secret weapon, a whistle that cranks up the volume, courtesy of his bro. Lead jumps in to restore the beast's hearing, and Jazz blows that whistle like it's nobody's business. The beast goes down like a sack of potatoes. Caligo swoops in, handing out gold stars for effort before showing them how it's done, netherworld style. With the beast defeated, they snap some victory picks. Meanwhile, Kiramu spotted some scared kiddos holed up in a shelter. She taps Elisabetta to babysit while she transforms into Dem Doll. And over with Amory, she's got a plan, distract the beast while Opera scoops up Clara. Teamwork makes the dream work, folks. Opera has a light bulb moment, realizing the beast's soft spot might be its noggin. Amory jumps into action, distracting the beast while Opera swoops in to scoop up Clara. Opera's in awe of Amory's strength and high rank, but Amory's not done yet. She unleashes her ultimate move, morphing her hair color and channeling her inner powerhouse. With a fierce battle cry, she's like, I am the strongest, the mightiest. The beast lunges, but Amory is too powerful, sending it flying with a single blow. Thanks to her romantista bloodline, she's practically unstoppable. When the beast tries a toxic gas attack, Amory is immune, thanks to her epic skills. She keeps laying the smack down on the beast, fueled by Kiramu's inspiring tunes ringing in her ears. After a thousand kicks to the noggin, Amory emerges victorious. But the toll of her power leaves her shaking like a leaf. Opera is in awe and offers her a spot at the Cherdom and home. But Amri's got other plans, like maybe moving in with Aruma. Yep, she's already planning the wedding bells. When Opera touches her, she starts trembling too. Clara, ever the stealthy one, reveals she's got a stash of weapons up her sleeve. Meanwhile, Aruma's playing hero, rescuing demon kids trapped under rocks. In a lighter moment, Jazz recalls the hefty fine his brother slapped him with for that whistle. As and Sabnuk team up to take down the demon, soaring towards the beast with battle cries ready. Meanwhile, Uruma and Balam are busy freeing trapped kids, wondering if As and Sabnok have made their move. Little do they know, As and Sabnok are knee deep in a full blown argument while trying to fight the beast. Balam's feeling like a lousy instructor, thinking his orders fell on deaf ears. But when As senses Uruma's frustration, he channels the anger into a devastating blow, shutting the beast down. Sabnok, not one to be outdone, chomps down on As's metal pendant before joining the fray. As summons his familiar, unleashing fire, while Sabnok counters with a watery assault. Balam's jaw drops as he watches the first years overpower the beast. Just when things are looking up, the beast unleashes a massive mana blast, hitting As and Sabnok square on. Aruma rushes to Az's aid, only to get knocked back by the beast's attack. Feeling helpless, Aruma reflects on his past struggles, but seeing his friends in danger breaks his heart. Balam points Aruma's attention skyward, where Sabnox conjured a shield to protect Az. Az is puzzled by Sabnox's sudden act of heroism, but Sabnox reveals he's got big dreams of becoming a legendary demon king. The beast shrugs off their fire assault, sending Az and Sabnox scrambling for cover behind a wall. The tension between them boils over into a heated argument. Sabnok questions Az's commitment to the fight, sensing Az's priorities shifting towards Aruma. He lays it out plain and simple, Az is so wrapped up in Aruma, he's forgotten his own ambitions. Sabnok's grown from his past, but Az, not so much. Az begrudgingly admits Sabnok might have a point, summoning a fiery barrier to hold off the beast and conceding, just this once. As Az and Sabnok hightail it out of there, drained of mana, the beast readies itself for another blast. But just in the nick of time, Balam swoops in like a hero, slamming the beast and saving the day. Aruma rushes to hug Az, relieved beyond words. Sabnok scoops them both up and makes a run for it, with Balam revealing his true power by conjuring a dragon to duke it out with the beast. After a fierce battle, Balam lands the final blow, leaving Az in awe of his magical prowess. Az is so impressed, he begs Balam for some pointers. Suddenly, the spirits of the defeated beasts merge into a superpowered entity, blasting them all with blinding light. Thankfully, Opera and Amory swoop in to save the day. Opera rallies Balam to take on the new beast together, knowing they'll need backup. They summon Caligo for reinforcements, while the students fill him in on the beast's transformation. Reluctant at first, Caligo eventually joins the fray, teaming up with Opera and Sabnok to take down the beast once and for all. Meanwhile, down in the prison, the inmates are bummed to see their plan foiled. 
but Karori is not giving up hope, predicting another showdown above ground. Suddenly, the beast revives itself, ready to detonate. Caligo calls on Agars to dig a hole, urging everyone to take cover underground. As they huddle in the makeshift shelter, they realize the beast's heading straight for them. The misfits try to redirect its path, but Caligo intervenes, warning them of the explosive consequences. Just when things look dire, Renov swoops in, diverting the beast's attention, albeit at his own peril. But before the beast can strike, Uruma dashes in, shielding Renov from harm. In a lighter moment, they concoct an exciting game involving hiding hundreds of demon chicks, because why not keep things interesting even in the midst of chaos? In a daring move, Uruma leaps in front of Renov, summoning Ali-san to the rescue. He commands Ali-san to devour all the mana the beast's about to unleash. But Ali-san's not just a hungry spirit, he's got his own flair and insists on lending a hand. With Uruma's imagination fueling him, Ali-san transforms into his ultimate form, swallowing the beast whole. Inside Aruma's belly, the beast goes boom, leaving behind a tiny lifeless critter. The spirits of the defeated beast bid you in a spectacular display of circles, restoring the sky to its former glory. As the students emerge from the shelter, Elizabeth laments missing the damn doll dance. Caligo, ever the stern teacher, scolds Aruma for his recklessness, but Aruma argues he can't help but rush to the aid of his loved ones. Meanwhile, in the prison, the Six Fingers make a dramatic entrance, busting Kariwo out on orders from Thunder Lord Ball. Kariwo's freedom is bittersweet for the other prisoners, who realize he's not planning to set them loose. Kariwo relishes in their despair, relishing his newfound freedom. Back on the ground, the crowd cheers for Uruma, with Renov's dad even dropping by to express his gratitude. But Yutoto puts a damper on Kariwo's plans to join the festivities. As the parade in Uruma's honor kicks off, Kariwo's about to crash the party, but Nirisan intervenes, revealing Ball's message. Ball urges Kariwo to retreat, assuring him their plan never involved destroying the park. Kariwo begrudgingly steps back, vowing to return someday, still seeing Uruma as his sworn enemy. Opera hands Uruma his bag, and inside, he finds a letter from Sullivan packed with instructions, the last one reminding him to have a blast. When Sullivan arrives at the hostel where Uruma's staying, he's a sobbing mess, overwhelmed by what Uruma endured. But Uruma reassures him he was well taken care of. Meanwhile, Caligo confides in Balam about some shady staff members being behind the chaos. No one remembers their names, but they've got a good mental sketch. Caligo returns to his room to find some misfits wreaking havoc. Unable to handle the chaos, he kicks them all out. Meanwhile, in the girls' room, they're over the moon with their new clothes. Amory is relieved to see everyone safe. They all head to the buffet to indulge. After devouring his meal, Uruma slips away to the terrace. Amory joins him, and they chat about her dress, a gift from Renov's dad. Uruma opens up about his dream of having fun with everyone and protecting that ideal. Amory playfully accuses him of being greedy, then suggests they sneak off together. But their alone time is cut short by Az and Clara, who burst in with news of a big cake and magic lessons with Balam. Uruma insists on sticking to their plans, much to Amory's dismay. Meanwhile, Renov's dad tries to hog the spotlight, but Sullivan sets the record straight, declaring Uruma the true hero. Suddenly, the demon press swarm Uruma for interviews and photos, sending him scrambling to escape. Opera suggests hiding him somewhere, and Clara volunteers her place. In a lighter moment, Balam awaits Caligo's arrival, only to find him looking exhausted. But Caligo's not about to let hunger ruin his mood, he's got food on the way. So, picture this, Uruma's off on his grand adventure, right? But lo and behold, Clara drops him an invite to her humble abode, making it his first ever friend house rendezvous. And let me tell you, folks, as his mind is blown to smithereens when he discovers that Clara actually lives in a real, live house. Can you believe it? But hold your useless horses, because Valak's siblings are about to hit him with a welcome party that's more special than a unicorn on roller skates. And while they're at it, they can't help but wonder who's the lucky guy swooning over Clara. But before they can even form the words, Clara swoops in like a ninja, shutting down the speculation train with a single glare. But wait, there's more. Uruma's eyes widen as he takes in the chaotic yet oh-so-fun atmosphere of the Valak household. Turns out, Papa Valak is quite the adventurer, always sending back souvenirs from his wild escapades. Result, Clara's crib is overflowing with knick-knacks, doodads, and thingamajigs galore. Now, let's talk dinner. The Valaks, they've got their own quirky way of naming dishes. Forget chicken nuggets or fried chicken, because in Valak land, it's all about the muffle duffle crackle bang. Paz tries to warn Aruma, but hey, where's the fun in sticking to the script, am I right? Just when they thought they'd seen it all, in waltz two more of Uruma's siblings, demanding a bedtime story. But hold on to your hats, folks, because Mama Valak pulls out the big guns, the memory book, complete with Clara's baby pics. But uh oh, looks like trouble's a brewin' as Clara catches wind of the impromptu photo sesh. She tries to play it cool, but when Uruma drops the C word, 
That's cute, folks, she goes full on blush mode. Quick, someone pass the ice. And just when they think they're in the clear, Mama Valak pulls out another album, proving once again that moms are the undisputed champions of embarrassing their kids. But fear not, for Clara swoops in with a strategic shopping time diversion, saving the day like the superhero she is. But hold on to your chopsticks, because it's cook-off time. As and Clara are locked in a battle royale to whip up the ultimate feast for Uruma. Let the culinary chaos commence. Meanwhile, at Amida Hill, the Valax embark on a shopping spree for the perfect ingredients. But leave it to Az to grab the wrong stuff, leading to a taste test that's more meh than MMM. Looks like our boy Az might need a crash course in grocery shopping 101. So, just when they thought things couldn't get any wilder, Mama Valak swoops in with a legendary ingredient quest straight out of a fairy tale. Picture this, the Hubbub Forest, home to the ultimate ingredient, Shabu Shabu from Collateral Cave. Mama Valak lays down the law, promising flavors so divine they'll make your taste buds do the cha-cha. Armed with a map and a whole lot of determination, our fearless squad, as Clara, and the gang embark on a mission to snag this culinary holy grail for Uruma's epic feast. But not so fast. Clara's siblings are playing gatekeepers, insisting that guests take a back seat. And as, what have your useless idiotic self done lately besides accidentally setting off fireworks in the neighbor's yard? As they venture deeper into the cave, they stumble upon the elusive Shabu Shabu fish, a bizarre creature with the body of a pig, the fins of a fish, and enough veggies to make a salad jealous. But uh oh, plot twist. The fish snags Clara's siblings, sending our heroes into full-on rescue mode. Clara summons her trusty familiar, but Az decides to go full Gandalf and busts out the fireballs. Spoiler alert, the fish ain't impressed. But fear not, for Clara's quick thinking and Az's ninja skills lead to a daring escape, complete with tentacle snipping and sibling saving. Talk about teamwork. But just when they think they're home free, Az has a revelation. He's still vertically challenged. But hey, who needs height when you've got a familiar on speed dial? With a wave of his wand, they're soaring out of there faster than you can say abracadabra. Enter Mama Valak, the ultimate fish slaying Mama Bear, who sends that oversized sushi roll packing with a single smash. Lesson learned, always aim for the nose when facing off against aquatic adversaries. Back at Casa de Clara, the gang kicks back for some well-deserved R&R, complete with playful antics and impromptu lullabies. As Clara serenades them into dreamland, Uruma's troubles melt away faster than ice cream on a hot summer day. Come morning, they're back at it, digging up breakfast like a band of culinary treasure hunters. Mama Valak captures the moment for posterity, stamping it in the memories album for future laughs. But little do they know, trouble's brewing on the horizon as a mysterious figure approaches. But hey, who's got time for drama when there's breakfast to be had? In a moment of downtime, Aruma can't help but ask Clara about her elder brother, expecting tales of madness and mayhem. Little does he know, the truth might just be crazier than fiction. As our merry band sits down for a meal at Clara's, the tranquility is shattered by the sound of the doorbell. Clara, being the brave soul she is, answers it to find none other than the demon border control officer standing tall. After a round of introductions, he whisks Aruma away, brandishing a restraining order against those pesky press folks. Aruma's eyes light up with the prospect of freedom, like a kid on the last day of school. Meanwhile, Amory is in full-on first date prep mode, trying to reach Aruma but failing miserably due to an acute case of shyness-induced trembling. Luckily, Aruma swoops in with a text, and plans are set in motion faster than you can say awkward encounter avoided. Cut to Amory, decked out in her finest swimwear at Lady Levy's aqua case, eagerly awaiting her Prince Charming. Aruma, on the other hand, embarks on a quest for the perfect swimsuit, unaware of the whirlwind of romance about to sweep him off his feet. As they embark on their aquatic adventure, Amory is determined to make this date one for the history books. But despite her best efforts, things aren't going exactly according to plan, leaving Amory feeling more flustered than a pufferfish in a blender. But fear not, for amidst the chaos, there's a moment of sweetness as Aruma gallantly rescues Amory from a sticky situation, earning himself a swoon-worthy smile in the process. And just like that, romance blooms amid the salt water and sunscreen. As they peruse the souvenir corner, Aruma's excitement knows no bounds as he picks out trinkets for his classmates. Amory, torn between rivalry and romance, can't help but admire his thoughtfulness, even if it means aiding the enemy. But as the day winds down, Amory's left pondering the age-old question, how does one balance duty and desire? While Aruma's off in gift-giving mode, she's left yearning for more romantic moments amidst the chaos of her responsibilities. And just when they think the day couldn't get any more magical, Aruma suggests a trip to the Mako Chanbo fortune-telling show, where demons and delights await. Ah, the plot thickens with the grand entrance of Mako-chan, the legendary matchmaker of the demon world. 
But hold on to your hats, folks, because this ain't your typical love connection. As Mako-chan picks Aruma out of the crowd like a prize catch, our hero's heart sinks faster than a lead balloon. Turns out, his human sense got him in hot water, and not the good kind. But fear not, for our fearless Amory swoops in like a guardian angel, saving Aruma from the jaws of embarrassment. Talk about a damsel in distress turned knight in shining armor. After the dust settles, the show managers are left eating humble pie as they hand out annual passes and apologies like candy on Halloween. With Mako-chan in the rearview mirror, Aruma's off to mend fences and salvage what's left of their less than stellar date. As they bid adieu to the disaster that was Mako-chan's matchmaking misadventure, Aruma shifts his focus to Amory, determined to turn their day around. Amory, still reeling from the calamity, braces herself for the worst. But leave it to our boy Aruma to turn lemons into lemonade with a simple question about her well-being. With a mixture of surprise and gratitude, Amory finds herself swept off her feet, quite literally, as Aruma offers to carry her to their next destination. Talk about chivalry in the face of chaos. And just like that, our dynamic duo sets off on a new adventure, with Amory's heart aflutter and Aruma's determination unwavering. As they make their way to the elusive third floor bench, hidden away like a treasure waiting to be discovered, Amory can't help but marvel at the unexpected turn of events. In a heartwarming twist, Amory's father reminisces about the days when his little girl was too afraid to venture out alone. But now, as she returns with a bounty of souvenirs in tow, he can't help but marvel at how far she's come. And so, as the sun sets on their tumultuous day, Aruma and Amory find themselves closer than ever, bound by laughter, love, and a shared sense of adventure. Who knows what the future holds for these two star-crossed demons. One thing's for sure, with love in the air and souvenirs in hand, anything is possible. Ah, the joys of homework, am I right? As Aruma sweats over his end-of-term assignments, Opera, the ever-enthusiastic cheerleader, roots for him like it's the final match of the Demon Olympics. But why, you ask, does poor Aruma have to suffer through double homework duty? Well, it all goes back to that epic showdown in Walter Park, where the gang's quest for fun landed them in hot water, double homework hot water, to be precise. But fear not, for Sullivan, the benevolent leader of the pack, swoops in with a decree, all teams are winners, and Caligo's picking up the tab. Balam, ever the voice of reason, questions Caligo's sudden generosity, but the man himself insists he's happy to foot the bill. After all, they're dead last now, and nothing says learning opportunity like double the homework, am I right? With homework woes behind him, Urim is whisked away on a shopping extravaganza by none other than Sullivan himself. As they hop into the carriage and set off, Sullivan tells his worthless self that, Urim is now a certified celebrity, which means it's time to bust out the disguise gear. Enter the detection warning glasses, because nothing says inconspicuous like oversized shades. Welcome to Babbles, the bustling hub of demon activity, where magical streets and mischievous demons abound. But thanks to Sullivan's savvy disguise, Aruma's incognito as they navigate the chaos of the magical street. Next stop, the bookstore, where Sullivan loads up on enough reading material to make even the most dedicated scholar sweat. Aruma, perplexed by the mountain of books, learns a valuable lesson in demon academia from his wise mentor. And with a gentle reminder to keep practicing his fractals, Aruma's ready to tackle whatever challenges lie ahead. But wait, what's this? A sticky-fingered demon kid tries to pull a fast one on Sullivan. But our quick-thinking hero turns the tables with a swift move that earns him a discount and a nod of respect from the store manager. Turns out, Sullivan's not just any demon, he's the real deal, with a rank that rivals even the Demon King himself. And just when they thought the day couldn't get any crazier, Aruma's gifted a Mogurin, a mischievous creature that's sure to keep things interesting. But hey, what's a little chaos among friends? As the sun sets on their shopping spree, Sullivan immortalizes their adventures with a portrait of Aruma, capturing the essence of their bond in vibrant hues and devilish charm. As the day winds down and their shopping bags overflow with treasures, Opera, the unsung hero of logistics, scurries off to organize their loot while Sullivan and Aruma settle in for a heart-to-heart. -heart. With a sigh, Sullivan admits that despite growing accustomed to life in the netherworld, the looming specter of the next term has him feeling a tad nostalgic. Enter the age-old question, how does one become the Demon King? Sullivan's eyes twinkle with mischief as he regales Aruma with a tale from years gone by, a meeting of the Demon Crowns, a missing Demon King, and a chance encounter that changed everything. But just as Aruma's imagination takes flight, Sullivan snaps him back to reality with a gentle nudge, reminding him of the weighty responsibility that comes with the title. Yet, true to form, our boy Aruma remains steadfast in his humility, insisting that he has no desire for such lofty aspirations. As they make their way home, Aruma finds himself standing in the street, pondering the possibilities of his own netherworld. With a wistful sigh, he removes his glasses and dares to dream of a realm where kindness reigns supreme. 
But as night falls and the stars twinkle overhead, Uruma's thoughts turn to the prophecy scroll, revealing the daunting tasks that await the chosen demon king. Yet amidst the uncertainty, there's a glimmer of determination in his eyes, a resolve to forge his own path, no matter the challenges that lie ahead. Back at Sullivan's home, plans are afoot for a leisurely term ahead, filled with lazy afternoons and endless adventures. But as the dawn breaks and a new day dawns, Aruma, Clara, and As march off to school, their backpacks laden with homework and hearts brimming with anticipation. In the hallowed halls of Babel's academy, a new decree rings out, all misfits must achieve the coveted Dalit rank before graduation, lest they face expulsion from the Royal One classroom. And so, with the promise of new beginnings on the horizon, our heroes stand poised to embark on their next great adventure. And thus concludes of our epic tale, filled with laughter, friendship, and the boundless potential of a young SS rank demon's dreams. Until next time, make sure you are subscribed to stay tuned for more devilish delights in the world of Welcome to Demon School, Aruma Kun.